Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. Welcome back after a long break to the Nausicast, which is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. I already said it, we had a long break, a much longer than what was actually announced last episode. I mean, I took a bit longer to write my thesis, but I graduated, have a job now, yay. And Congratulations. Thank you very much. And also the fruits of my thesis will be shared with everyone once we get to the When Marnie Was There episode, which is Ooh, next episode. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, indeed, because I spent a lot of time doing Nausicaa's research for actual schoolwork for once, you know, that's that's a thing. Um, efficient. It, very efficient. I think I put, you know, my hobby and my professional education uh, together in a perfect synergy. But today... We're not going to be talking about when Mani was there. We're going to be talking about The Tale of Princess Kaguya from 2013, the last movie director Isao Takahata directed before he died in 2018. Just double checking. Yes, 2018. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rest in rest in peace. Rest the legend. in peace, Takahata. Yeah, and uh, at the time of making this movie, he didn't know yet that it would be his last. But in 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 a surprising turn of events, and what we probably will be discussing, it does feel like a swan song in many ways. Um, but before we get into that, you can find us everywhere you, where you can find podcasts on Spotify on the Apple thing. That is not called iTunes, I think, anymore for podcasts, but like Apple Podcasts or just, whatever. Yeah, App Apple Podcasts. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is on Lipsyn for downloading or adding us to your favorite podcast app at nausicast.lipsyn.com. And you can find all the links to find us everywhere, also on YouTube, in the description. Today with me to talk about the tale of Princess Kaguya are Hipster Cthulhu. Uh, it's me. I remembered again. He, him. And also, no one complained in the comments that it took us too long. It was appropriate. This movie took eight years to make. It was way over budget. And now this podcast will be the highest budget, most uh, long in the making one you've heard yet. That is unfortunately true. <laughs> <laughs> um, also with me, Platon Skull. Hello, hello. Uh, looking forward to discuss the uh, only Ghibli film that shows naked titty. Uh, my uh, my pronouns are he him. <laughs> Crude is always blatant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> also with us is Voice Flower. Hi everybody, it's Voice Flower. My pronouns are she her, and wow, uh, this will be also my uh, first cast. I mean, I missed um, from up on Poppy Hill and uh, The Wind Rises, so. It's been an even longer hiatus for me, so this yeah, is exciting. You've been out a while. I've I've heard people ask for you, so hey, people yeah, in the audience. and thanks for everybody who asked back. for me. I'm I'm back. <laughs> but popular, popular demand. Popular demand. So much hey. that we had to get rid of the Sandra. They couldn't be here because... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the platform by voice. No. no, 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 no. That's <laughs> not true. That's not true. Also here is me, Niard, he, him, your humble host today. And, um, well, we, sh we can get right into the creation of the movie. And uh, it's interesting because Takahara, uh, who we last discussed a long time ago on uh, our podcast about My Neighbors, the Yamadas, and which is a movie from 1999. Go check out that episode. And uh, as you can probably already tell, between 1999 and 2013, that's a lot of time that passes where... You That's at, at least 10 years, right? That is at <laughs> least 10 years. Yeah. I need. Yeah. I, I, th wow. I think I need to double check with our accounting department, but I think it's a, it's a bit over 10. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, one of the main reasons for this happening, if we would trust Miyazaki, is that Takahara is like a sloth, uh, like a sloth, like the, the animal, the sloth. The sloth. Yeah. Oh my God, this is yeah. so hard sloth. to pronounce. Three-toed sloth. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But yeah. the one who moves so slow that moss grows on him. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> this is what Miyazaki likes to call Takahata. But there's also another reason, an interesting <laughs> reason, which is that uh, Yamada's kind of ruined uh, Studio Ghibli's production cycle because uh, My Neighbors the Yamada's is a movie that is, in terms of its style and its production pipeline, so different from the kind of cell animation that Studio Ghibli does for all their other films that it was 
a nightmare production wise to even get the movie made and uh i think miyazaki remained salty about it for a while how my neighbors the amados kind of messed up his studio before he went into making spirited away and yeah it was also, it also a part of his uh, disappointment i think whoa everyone um, at once holy shit oh damn sorry <laughs> go ahead hipster. i, I was think. just saying it also did not uh perform well in cinemas at all like Ghibli's other movies, you know, they were they, they usually expect to do really well, but Yamada's didn't at all. So, right. So I don't know if they put them in to, dead or anything, but it certainly didn't help the studio in any way. Yeah. In addition to like ruining their setup for production, uh, because they had to let a lot of uh, animators go actually, because it was just a, it's such a different way of doing things that not everybody had the skill set for that. Um, yeah, if you think about and, studio organizing, you kind of want to keep all hands busy at all times. But if you have right. such something so unfamiliar to the studio, something with such a different sort of pipeline, you can't do that. So many hands were idle uh, for long stretches of time during Yamadas. And incidentally, also during Kaguya Hime, uh, there's also a, a bit about this in a cool documentary about the making of Kaguya Hime, where we can actually see that um, uh, producer Nishimura and Takahara basically tell the team together that yeah no you 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 get, you go home now see you in two weeks we need to finish the storyboards first. Yep. Oh my god that 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 scene in the documentary was so tense like you just tell Takahara is just like oh my god it's come to this. Yeah. Which and is note, like I gotta bring out the whip. Yeah. Side note. Not uh, for the for for Takahara and Tanabe. That's <laughs> that's who he's bringing out the whip for. Yeah, Nishimura uh, Yoshiaki, uh, the uh, the producer on this film. This was his uh, first anime production. Um, he was uh, like uh, born in uh, nineteen seventy seven, so he's a bit pretty young at the time. Like for for a producer in such a prestigious uh, film, uh, you know, uh, studio. So like like what what an absolute champ. <laughs> To and get, to yeah. get this thing done. And what it a is, producer it, it, he is, because after Yamada's Takahata had basically resolved that he is tired of cell animation and never wants to do it again. And only if he ever could do a movie in the style of Yamada's again, which is like scribbly, scratchy drawings and watercolor backgrounds and stuff like that, where there's basically lots of empty visual space and white and gaps in, instead of the realism of Ghibli cell animation. Only if he could do that again would he want to make a movie again. So there was definitely an arduous and hard task for a producer like Nishimura who really wanted Takahara to make another movie. And what a champ. He, he really made him do it. Well, it's... In the documentary, it, it stated that Nishimura was like doggedly, you know, trying to convince Takahara to make another film for a whole 18 years before Takahara oh, finally relented. 18 months. Uh, no, I mean, 18 yeah. months, excuse <laughs> 18, me. 18 years. No, no, no. no 18 Damn. months. But 18 months is a long time. It's over a year, yeah. a year and a yeah. half just to try to say, okay, I will. <laughs> But one of the conditions for that was actually to set up a whole different studio for Takahata to work with freelancers on this project. Yeah. Because Ghibli's Studio Studio 7, and maybe you remember us talking during the Wind Rises episode about A Kingdom of Dreams and Madness and how Takahata doesn't really show up in it. Like they talk about him, about how he's working on his movie, but we don't see him. Well, this is the reason. He was at Studio 7, a whole different studio that they built just to get Kaguya Hime done. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's also, again, a matter of, like, the the stylistic uh, changes and the different uh, pipeline, which means, like, different demands for the for, for the talents uh, involved. Uh, yeah, for once, actually, maybe a couple of other times, but generally Studio Ghibli keeps it all, like, in-house. They train their own animators and, like, bring them up. They, they you know, they do their whole career at Ghibli. But for this, they had to hire a lot of people from outside, and like you said, they made a new studio. So it ended up being, I believe, unless something's changed, it's most expensive Japanese-produced movie ever. Yeah, it's, it's uh, also their the... budget just kept going over the years and years. Like, uh, 
It's like 40 million or something in dollars. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where on the uh, press conference for the release of the movie, one interview, uh, one journalist came up to them and said, this movie was really expensive. Why was it so expensive in a really, you know, demanding way? And the answer uh, that Nishimura basically gave when he stood up and answered was the same that you just gave. It was important to make a whole new studio for the production of this because it was so different in the production. Mm. So it's definitely a huge, huge investment on the side of Ghibli and everyone involved in this project to it's, get this uh, off the it, ground even. I believe it's also the longest of the Ghibli movies. Yeah, at, at 137 minutes, it is the longest Ghibli movie, which isn't long by regular movie standards, but you have to imagine no, for no, animation no. movies, it's really, really long, especially hand-drawn mm. animation. There's over 1,400 cuts. Lots that's of them. That's a mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a lot, and especially and with a... Yeah. yeah. And the most crazy thing about this is that one artist's style was extremely important for this movie, so important that he basically was tasked to create just about every keyframe, which is uh, uh, the character designer Tanabe. Um, yeah. Not having his first name on hand. Um, Osamu, Osamu. Osamu Tanabe. Thank you very much. I knew someone would save me here. Um, his <laughs> style was basically, well, Takahara basically demanded of him and said, listen, we don't want refined drawings. We want some sketchy, uh, naturalistic looking drawings just out of your feather because your style is what I really want in this movie. And so the entire production pipeline was organized around Tanabe drawing basically all the keyframes in his style and all the animators filling in like with scratchy and naturalistic lines trying to mimic his style, everything in between. Very different from how it usually is where you have many different key animators and give them big scenes. Like here, Tanabe is basically the guy and everything yeah. is downstream of his work. And it still required incredibly talented animators to make this oh, sort yeah. of style even work. Because Absolutely. even though you have one guy doing all the keyframes, basically, you need a staff that can perfectly reproduce his style in filling in everything else right yeah. and usually in the in the cleanup stage you know the animators will use really hard and very clean lines to you know outline the animated uh you know figures but in this uh project like takahara insisted like no it has to have that same energy that same roughness that same ephemerality that is in Tana Tanabe's, um, you know, key uh, keyframes, and um, to to really bring this movie to to life in the visual, you know, language that he he wanted, and a yeah. lot of the animators were just like, yeah, it's it's really grueling, like <laughs> it's so yeah. different, and uh, yeah. Which is uh, what we alluded to when we talk about how the production pipeline was so different because, like, the whole like cleanup process was just like not really as much a thing with this uh, with this type of movie, and it was uh, re replaced yeah. by a kind of animation, you know, production that was very new for a lot of the uh, staff and took a long time to get the hang of. I'm sure. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Also very different from the usual Ghibli style because basically the way they managed to do this was go very digital for many things. So like, of course, the images are digitally composed instead of being cells. And furthermore, they had like a sophisticated piece of software that Takahata was constantly using to check the animations and so on. That's not not usually the, the type of Ghibli uh, style where a lot is still was still always drawn by hand and animations could be checked by hand and all of that. This was absolutely not the case in in this uh, circumstance. Yeah, another thing. Yeah, uh, I think worth, it, oh, sorry. So uh, another thing worth remarking here is uh, we've discussed this before, but like uh, uh, Takahata isn't an like an animator in the same way that uh, that Hayao Miyazaki is. Mm -hmm. where, where Miyazaki he like ha would draw like detailed storyboards and uh, and like work on key animations for uh, for for like key sequences and uh, was really hands on in that way. Uh, Takahata is not as much an of a, of like a, a drawer and artist 
uh, at some point in the documentary, the uh, making of documentary, um, so, so like someone notes, I think it's like, uh, I think it might have been like someone quoting Miyazaki that like uh, maybe like what something that allowed Takahata to like move beyond like the expectations of the of animation was the fact that he didn't conceptualize his uh, his uh, like his scripts his works uh, as an animator first and foremost, uh, which I think I think is a really interesting observation. Yeah, yeah I, I think the, the two documentaries show that like. Uh, Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, and then the one about Kaguya, like really contrasts Miyazaki and Takahata and their styles. Because, like you said, yeah, uh, Takahata, he's more of the filmmaker, and Miyazaki's like the animator. Where uh, oh, I think um, Joe Hasaishi um, even says that, that like with Takahata, it's like making a movie for him is a process of an elimination. He like has yeah. an idea, and he has to slowly whittle, whittle away all the elements that he feels won't match the movie until he has an idea of what he wants. The Miyazaki, yes. I think, Dream Kingdom of Dreams Madness shows that Miyazaki kind of has ideas, but he's always like doing the details. He's always redrafting on like reanimating scenes himself, kind of a perfectionist, and he wants to go for like the detail. And eventually, he fi- ends up finding the movie in all the yeah. the scenes he's put together. Like he ends up changing things even at the last minute. He's yeah, considering uh, all the smaller parts of it. You see it a lot in well, the documentary. Well, he starts out with a. He starts out with a really strong vision. One, yeah, and you know that's that's the other thing that Hisaishi says. You know, when he is working with Takahata, is like, yeah, you get the sense that he doesn't have a very clear vision of what he wants, but he finds it by process of elimination. Whereas he'll know, you know it when he sees it. <laughs> he'll know it when he sees yeah, it. Whereas Miyazaki yeah. is more, um, he has a stronger vision, but then creates. He, he he has the outline of the vision very clearly, but how he fills it in, he discovers as he goes. But the you know the vision for what he wants is a lot stronger. So Takahata also another production thing yeah. is um, that unlike a lot of anime movies, and this was I think they also this was also true of Trevor the Fireflies is they recorded the actors' lines first. They had them like do their whole script, so they knew exactly how the movie was going to right. be. Like in only like yesterday, the, the same was um, the same was the case with uh, Omoi de Pura Pura. Um, yeah, yeah. Only yesterday, Takahata just likes specifically to make films like this. It gives him a yeah. much stronger idea of what to do with it. Like, yeah, and then they can animate around the actors' performances, which I think really shows in his movies. Yeah. Just to clarify, uh, only yesterday, it's spe- specifically the present day uh, sequences on the farm and not the flashback sequences uh, were like recorded beforehand, which gave that like a bit of contrast, which we talk about on the episode. Yes, go check out our Only Yesterday episode, which feels like it was only yesterday, but it's actually been like two years mm-hmm. or something. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we've Shit. been at it for a while. So, <laughs> oh, no. uh, but, but continue on. I, I think Takahata has conceptual ideas of what he wants so when he talks to the lady who sings the outro song or who who wrote the outro song he would tell her what kind of feeling he wants to impart on the viewers he tells her oh you you need to soothe them after this you know ending that left them confused and so on and he'll have conceptual ideas for all his other uh, people too he says to Tanabe come on I, I I need your sketchy style because I think when people sketch and draw fast there's some passion that gets lost when you do the precise line work afterwards so uh, afterwards so I need the fast pencil lines to capture the passion and also to the background artist Kazuo Oga who is like known for his hyper-realistic extremely detailed background art from My Neighbor Totoro and Only Yesterday he tells him I want you to paint like lightly painted watercolor backgrounds with like lots of white and fading at the edges and everything feels that sort of there's something missing incomplete impressionistic those are like his instructions and he just has these conceptual ideas and then he gets his artists to show him ideas and he says yes or no depending on you know how well they did until it looks like what he uh 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 you know, suggested in the concept. And, you know, in the movie, it is shown as like somewhat of an arduous process where like, especially a voice actor, in this case, uh, the voice actor of the father, um, Mm -hmm. his name was, um, sorry, uh, Takeo Chi. Takeo Chi. Yeah. Yeah. He he has him reread lines of the father, like what, 20, 30, 40 times until he's satisfied and says, yep, this is good. 
Uh, Takeuchi, by the way, also died after this movie, making this also his last movie that he would make oh. in his career. So, uh, really rest sad, in though. He was too. probably the most powerful performance in the whole movie, I felt. Like, he was great. Oh, yeah. Uh, as the dad. You, you, you could uh, get a Especially the scene where he's, now. like, wheezing and um, coughing, you know, cheering her on as a baby. Yeah. You like, could he get... sounds like his lungs are giving out. You, you could you could learn everything you needed to know about this character through the voice performances kind of inflection mm. and style mm. like his good heartedness but his like sort of rising obsession with which he uh, uh, dedicates himself to his fantasy of what a good life for his daughter would look like yeah um, right. but before we get too deep into movie analysis yeah. um, of course they production then we we talked a little bit about how hard it was to set up the studio and of course how hard it was for nishimura to get takahata to work on it but then finally he managed by creating this studio which led to a production where interestingly um the first five years of the movie being officially in production were dedicated i think almost exclusively exclusively to setting up the studio and getting the script written and the casting done so like five years of production are over and we only have that to show for ourselves, right? The script and the casting and the studio, of course, which is wild. Like for an eight-year production period, I think is is a lot. Um, yeah. And <laughs> but there's even more in terms of how long it took to actually get this movie made. When we talk about the idea for the movie, so in terms of we often talk about how did they get the idea for this script we often talk about like Miyazaki and Suzuki talking about a book they like or something for mm -hmm. Isao Takahata the roots of this idea are actually much much older uh, it appears and and he talks about this in some interviews that already in the 60s while he was working for Toei Animation there was a plan in Toei Animation to make an animated version of uh, The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter and back then Takahata had an idea and he pitched it to them he said hey we need to um, rewrite these things in this story to make it make more sense to contemporary viewers. And his idea wasn't taken and the toy movie was never made. But since then, there was kind of this inkling of an idea. So a 50-year history of Takahata carrying that seed of an idea for adapting the tale of the bamboo cutter in this way was, was carry, he was carrying with him. So... Um, uh, yeah, um, I believe Takahata said that he's always found the story interesting because as a child, when he he heard it, he felt it, he never empathized with it. He like didn't understand what was happening and like didn't feel like the story made a whole lot of sense to him emotionally, at least. And then he mm -hmm. said, there's actually a quote in, from one interview that says, um, I aspire to have people empathize with the true story of the princess that was not depicted in the original tale. So he feels like with this movie, he isn't just like telling you the story. He's actually like getting to to a real deeper reality that the yeah. the kind of folk tale leaves out by being like very vague and you know kind of short, and also, also recontextualizing many scenes from yeah, and, pretty modern it, perspective. All right, it, so. it gets to a truer uh, version of the story because it kind of. Uh, is trying to reveal the biases that are implicit to that original tale. I, I think in a very subtle way, that is exactly correct voice, but also it's kind of done through the question that Takahata says, it is strange, the, the original story is strange, and it's hard to empathize with Kaguya, and the real story would be one that allows us to empathize with her and mm -hmm. to understand what it means for her to return to the moon, like to ask the question, why does she want or need to return? And why did she come down to earth in the first place? Yeah. And these things are all incidentally, and we'll get into this, like questions about Kaguya's as, as a character, subjectivity, like her ideas, opinions, uh, needs, motivations, wants, which, um, you know, are really brought out by a few subtle changes Takahata does to the right. script. Uh, of so, the original uh, just story. To, um, ju just to just uh, to to clarify a bit, let's uh, let's talk about uh, the uh, tale of the bamboo cutter, uh, Takatori Monogatari. Oh yeah, uh, right. It's a uh, it's a monogatari that is a uh, a, a fairy tale, uh, a, a written fairy tale, um, with an uh, yeah. unknown author from the uh, from the tenth uh, century thereabouts. Yeah, but just important, um, it's not oral tradition. It is definitely like court literature of like written mm -hmm. at the Japanese courts to, you know, yes. 
exactly. Yes, but uh, the, 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 there are like some elements that might suggest that it has some uh, like roots in, uh, in, in folk tales. Uh, and it has like since become so ubiquitous in like Japanese uh, culture to like almost have uh, gotten like a folk tale status. Um, but yeah, it, it is important to know that it, it was authored uh, and it was authored by uh, someone from the aristocracy because they could read and uh, and write. Um, it's uh, from the uh, the Heian period, which was uh, characterized by you know. Uh, the uh, like very very wealthy uh, elite uh, doing culture while everyone else was doing everything else. Um, just <laughs> that's that's the history lesson from uh, from the Norse cast. Um, yes. Anyway, the uh, <laughs> anyway the, the the story follows uh, the this uh, girl born out of a uh, uh, this princess uh, who was sent down to Earth from the moon and uh, and born out of a a uh, bamboo stalk, um, which a an old uh, bamboo cutter uh, finds, and he and his wife uh, adopt this uh, this tiny little princess, who um, who begins to grow up really really quickly. Uh, things like about three month period or something before she's already like a young maiden, um, and uh, they are also uh, gifted with uh, great wealth. He finds uh, he finds like hordes of gold in. Uh, in these uh, bamboos that that he's cutting out, out in the grove, and uh, they build a a palace and uh, and try to give her, you know, m- make her into like the proper princess that she is. And of course, she is like divinely beautiful, and uh, and the rumor like goes around the country that like this beautiful beautiful princess has arrived. Uh, she gets a number of suitors. She rejects them all, um, and we get all some nobles. more details on five particular suitors, like the, the most eligible bachelors oh, okay. in all the land. Well, they weren't bachelors because most uh, noblemen practiced polygamy uh, in those times. Um, but at any rate, uh, she, uh, she like uh, uh, Kaguya, uh, who is named Kaguya at this point by uh, a like namer. You got your like special name uh, w- when you, you know, come of age. And um, she tells each of these five suitors to get her a very, like, rare or very hard to get uh, treasure. Uh, Each one a different one. And uh, the story tells of, like, each of their, like, exploits to either, uh, like, make a fake version of it or actually try to to get it. Uh, And they all, like, fail or lose face in some way. Um... And uh, at last, the emperor learns of uh, of all these shenanigans and this beautiful lady who's rejecting everyone. Uh, and he uh, invites her to to court. She refuses to go, so he he goes to her, tries to uh, uh, tries to go and embrace her, and she magically like disappears. Um, and he's like, "Oh, okay, something magical here is going on. Gotta gotta be be nice about it." Uh, and he uh, he like leaves her alone for uh, for the time being, and this is when the uh, princess Kaguya uh, reveals to her uh, parents that she is from the moon and she has to go back. Uh, the uh, like the the army from the moon, the the heavenly uh, entourage, uh, like, yeah, the entourage of heaven will arrive uh, on on the full moon on the fifteenth of August, and she will have to leave them behind. And this was uh, why. She uh, rejected everyone because she she wanted to stay with uh, with her father as uh, long as possible, and she's uh, got grown very like melancholy and depressed. And uh, the uh, the old bamboo cutter he con- contacts the emperor, gets an, uh, a whole army to uh, to try to uh, like fend off the this uh, <laughs> this heavenly entourage. And uh, Kaguya's like that that's not gonna work. And a surprise, surprise, it doesn't. Everyone loses their will to fight immediately as this entourage comes down. She is clad in a, in a uh, feathered robe, which will uh, take away her memories. Um, right before that, she, uh, she drinks a, a potion of immortality. Um, and she goes off to heaven. Uh, and at the very end of the story, she it turns out she sent the rest of the potion along with a letter to the emperor being like I'm uh, I'm very sorry I 
wish I could stay. I, I think I might have been happy with you. Here's the immortality potion if you like, if you want it. Um, and the emperor, he de- he decides not to drink it, and he sends his army up to the top of Mount Fuji to uh, to burn the potion, to uh, basically to to like communicate this to uh, to the princess. And uh, th- this is said to be like the reason why Mount Fuji like smokes every now and then. And that's um, and well, you, you you might like be a bit skeptical, be like, wait, Mount Fuji doesn't smoke. Well, yeah, it did back when this thing, this uh, tale was written. Um, it was uh, active really? up until like about the uh, like like nine hundred and five, I believe, is uh, the estimate. Oh wow! Um, yeah, that's a neat so, uh, bit. Yeah, which which basically. Uh, that specific part is what what makes me especially like suspicious that it might have some folkloric uh, roots because it has that explanatory element. You know, it, it it ends with an explanation for some natural phenomenon, which is very typical of like um, mythology and old old folk tales. Right. Um, and uh, w- with that other way, the adaptation is like remarkably faithful in many ways. But it uh, it differs from the uh, the original in some uh, key ways, and it expands on some elements that are basically like not like really relevant in the original text, which uh, we will absolutely get into because those differences are like essential to understanding what Takahata is doing. With Indeed, this movie. I think Takahata even said that he did intend to be quite faithful to the kind of story that everyone knew in Japan because it's basically a very ubiquitous and extremely famous story that is basically yes. told to all children there. And he wanted yeah, to remain like, faithful. I think, yeah. I think it is the oldest, uh, or at least one of the oldest uh, monogatari surviving. Uh, yeah, it yeah. is considered to be the oldest surviving work of, of, of this like genre. Yeah, exactly. Which is like real old you know yeah and, and and his ambition was in a way to uh be extremely faithful to it which he accomplished but also to reveal as we were talking about before the true story and for him the true story was very interested in things that kaguya experienced that the original story did not make clear in a way that he thought people could empathize with such as her experiencing the richness of life on earth and you know the the tragic reasons that make her want to return to the moon in that one moment well we'll get into um and this is probably how we are going to do this podcast in a very unusual style we usually talk broadly about themes and jump from the beginning and the end of the movie back and forth back and forth always talking about whatever comes to mind in a free-flowing style i think this time we're going to be much more oriented along the structure the actual structure of the movie which uh, is is how we're gonna get into unraveling bit by bit every act of the movie. Yeah, and unless so, we have more about the production and conceptualization, um, we could probably get right into the first act. Oh, I was uh, just gonna say that, like, if we were to summarize the changes between this and the story and the original story, I would say it's kind of you know all in the title. It's the movie is way more interested with the internality of Kaguya than it is the surrounding events and like tale like nature, and it's, it's yeah. fitting that um, the original story is, is mostly referred to as the tale of the bamboo cutter, but this movie is the tale of Princess Kaguya. Like mm-hmm. the title itself is like importantly telling you who the main character is, this not is right. the the dad who cuts bamboo and then is like less important as the story goes on, but. This Kaguya is herself, the central figure. Such a good observation. Thank you for that. I, I actually hadn't thought about that aspect, but yeah, holy yeah. shit. Like, <laughs> well, there, there is a degree to which like the original fairy tale is also known by the name uh, uh, Kaguya Hime no Monogatari, but, that's, but that, that, that is absolutely true, that the original is named after the bamboo cutter and not Kaguya. And it, I think it reveals something of the biases of the you know, one who penned it, because... It's very centered around, you know, this male figure uh, yeah. in the title. Well, I, I'm not uh, like I, th- I think most scholars uh, like uh, ha- have like s- some. Th- there's some like theories as to who wrote it. And I think most of the theories are like male authors. But um, mm-hmm. 
something like really unique historically about the Heian period is like a lot of this like uh, sources from the time and uh, and like cultural works of the time were penned by women uh, by uh, yeah women in in this like obviously like, very privileged women um, yeah. but but nevertheless like that that is like uh, something to to keep in mind that. Uh, um, when you discuss the Heian period. That is true. Also, not related related at all, at all, but in my research of this, I did very interestingly find about the history of Kabuki, that Kabuki was originally um, performed mostly by female prostitutes, and it was, like, kind of for, like, working people. It was, like, a street craft of, like, doing fun, wacky shows in crazy costumes for people. But then the uh, the nobles of the time liked kabuki and so they took it and made it illegal for women to do kabuki and then it suddenly was a male art only performed for rich people so uh, hmm. it's very interesting how the arts yeah. uh, uh, turn over like that in history yeah. and i think that's very apropos hmm. at least for the themes of this movie <laughs> yeah patriarchy such fun hmm. um fun 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 well uh we're gonna get to that and we're gonna get to the courtly life um but uh, we we start where where the movie starts in uh, with this uh, bamboo cutter uh, couple uh, oh, out in out in the moment, mountains out in a moment the earlier we start with ideal. something very different. Platon, sorry to interrupt you, but <gasps> I think it is really nice how this movie starts with opening credits front loaded with these nice paper backdrops rem- reminiscent mm-hmm. of like old Japanese. Ozu movies again. Ozu often had like uh, we we talk, talked about this only yesterday where it was similar where there was like a burlap sack as the background and like the writing on top. But like this very classic style of introducing movies with like front loaded credits and music. Thought it was a really nice touch that kind of brings this really modern 2013 movie, uh, but but it gives you the feeling of old Japanese cinema. Um, yeah, it's, it, there's it doesn't some have cultural an... memory yeah. embedded yeah. right there in the in the very first moments. Yeah, it, it doesn't have For an some intro. Some reason, my the version of the film did some... not have these opening credits. It just starts. <laughs> so I guess I missed out on this bit. Yeah, I think I, I think you might have uh, seen it. You know, found a version online that skips that. So that, but let's not go into details and incriminate anyone. Um, right. That's um, that's kind of rough that they skip it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. That, that, that's like uh, I'll take it up with the person who posted it. Dunya. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah okay um well uh at any rate like the beginning part where uh we we see uh kaguya or uh, uh at this point she's not named kaguya she uh, has uh, no her, name so far yeah no, well her parents call her uh, hime a uh, princess and uh like the uh the, the kids around the uh uh the countryside call her takenoko which literally le- means like bamboo child but also is the word for like a uh, a young bamboo shoots uh, in the ground um so but but she's later named kaguya hime by uh, this like nobleman but i think it's just w- practical that we call her kaguya throughout for for clarity i was actually intending to go through the different names she goes by for this podcast because i think uh, as to the point of names Names are really important in this movie as to because yeah. how so many different people have different names for her, different expectations put on her. But That's right. it's also interesting yeah. what the kind of names are that she more identifies with, that she wishes back for. Because she is named by others always, but she's named Takenoko by the children that live with her in the in the forest, basically, outside in the countryside. And she's named Hima by the parents who keep calling her Hima no matter what. Uh, but Kaguya, Kaguya Hima, that is her name that she receives at the court and associates her with the court. And with her, let's say, accepting the names that she's given in different circumstances come, comes a lot as to how she acts and what she thinks and feels in that moment. So at first, I would definitely call her Takenoko. And I want to make mm-hmm. this distinction clear by how when she first appears in the bamboo shoot, we see this otherworldly image of like a tiny but fully grown, well, not fully grown, but like a tiny sublime little child in like fancy dress sitting in that bamboo shoot surrounded by like these 
these the the the, the bamboo shoot opens into like a lotus flower or something i think she's and it's definitely like, otherworldly at yeah. that moment she's not human yeah. yet but within no, a, yeah, within no, a not few a, not a child exactly but but a doll version of, of a, a, of a, of a, a doll is good right like she appears as a dignified otherworldly being but within seconds she transforms or within minutes of the movie she transforms into a normal baby well and, hold on yeah only when she only when she is taken into the arms of her mother does she actually transform into a baby right the moment that the mother receives her the her adoptive mother exactly so, which of course he you know she she's the one like oh you know she wants me to take care of her she her expectations of this spirit that th that her husband found are that it's it's for her to raise as a child and so that's what uh you know the the being becomes is it right. transformed into this infant right away but yeah i think all the little bits where she she uh, throughout her childhood she slowly grows up quickly let's say like a bamboo sprout at these moments but i think they're all very key moments in which she transforms like they're all like uh important little plot beats but yeah, definitely the fresh show her the, meeting more people's expectations. It's almost like every time she meets like a new like part of her life that's developing, she shoots up to meet it almost. I definitely want to uh, uh, highlight the transformations of this character throughout this movie. I, I would say that in this first act, she transforms from the moon princess that she would later return to be again uh, into Takenoko, which is the child that lives and grows up there. And it's like a goofy child, like playing with the frogs and falling over and, you know, all the uh, hijinks that she gets up to. But the difference is between this dignified pose of this otherworldly well dignity she in, turns into this human child which is like the marker of innocence and joy and happiness and the experiencing of life's richness and color and animals and friends and all of that that's uh, the transformation that she undergoes in this part which is marked by the name Takenoko which is you know my angle on this uh, and this act I suppose yeah, yeah uh, and I think it, it's an interesting scene. The, particularly the most important scene right at the beginning of this is the scene with the um, where she's first walking, and it's like the clapping contest between the kids of the neighborhood who are trying to win her over. Like then they're going Takenoko, they're cheering her, but then the the dad's going Hime uh, to call her over, and like this battle of wills, like illustrated right before us of the two kinds of people that are. Uh, uh, Kaguya, I guess, uh, to call it, is thought to be. Indeed. Because interestingly, yeah, like you said, right at the beginning, the first thing that happens is the dad basically names her Hime. He's like, she's a princess, she's a gift to me. And that's kind of, I guess, the original heaven, sin right? of this story, this uh, objectification of her from the very beginning, where the dad immediately sees this child and believes, oh, this is for me, this is like my thing. And she's um, my princess. She's going to be like this way that I perceive her. I disagree. I disagree that he, 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 he imagines that she is a gift from heaven that he can enjoy, but he is very much yeah. dedicated to her happiness. Like, indeed. And, that's true, and, but and, I and think the that's way that like he, the, the, the way that he comes to attempt to bring her happiness is very misguided and goes into this idea of patriarchal fantasy but we're gonna get there later at the beginning though even though i think that the the name he may it's not as used by her parents in this pastoral uh you know act is not one of uh of othering it's just one of endearment is one of of saying you are so dear to me you know but Yes, I do agree that there is this sort of foreshadowing of her destiny in this scene where, you know, there's the country, you know, children calling her Takenoko and beckoning her. And then there's her father, you know, beckoning her. He met. Oi, there, he yeah. I love yeah. that scene. Yeah, just losing and his voice and, uh, and cra cracking up. And I, I think like that performance, especially like, uh, it's the reason I I'd agree with uh, with voice on this one that um, that it's it's not like a type of like objectification a type of like oh this is for me but like this um, but but this like over eager protective uh, father who like 
loves this child so much but doesn't know what to do about it. Right. Whereas the the mother, uh, she is so like assured and accepting of uh, of, of it all, and uh, and mm-hmm. just um, and, and, and she and, calls and clearly, her Hime as well. But yeah. to contrast the father, you know, she is always. Uh, I think overeager is the perfect way to describe the father because he, later on, you know, he he's seeking for the best way to bring her happiness, and he uses. The, the way that he tries to do this is by taking the template of this patriarchal, uh, you know, court life as what he thinks will bring her the most happiness. It's not done out of malice or out of selfishness. It, absolutely. It's, yeah. Well, it, uh, but I don't it's, think but it's mutually falsely, exclusive. I think no, they they're not. objectify her, but still there is like a genuineness. Exactly. So, the so, thing is, he, 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 wants to, he wants her to be as happy, but... It just so happens that in his sort of blind following of this patriarchal fantasy, he is incidentally subscribing to a kind of culture which will objectify her. So the but important it's thing not here, the purpose behind it. Yeah, I agree with you. The guys. mother, on the other hand, although she calls, uh, you know, Takenoko or she calls the main character Hime as well. She always has deference to her. She's always very patient. She always she's willing to listen. She's willing to ask questions. She's willing to um, bear with, you know, and accept Kaguya's uh, or Takenoko's emotionality and her vulnerability, uh, and I, has almost no expectations of her. This I, naming is already getting really confusing. I, yeah, I, th- I think we should stick it. with one. <laughs> I think what we are uh, looking at here is uh, ac- actually from Takahata a class discussion already in this first act because mm-hmm. uh, the bamboo cutter and his wife are not only very poor and very simple people in the sense that they live uh, like in a small hut out in nature and the daily life is basically just chopping bamboo and selling it. You know, that's um, all they do. And all their life, at least from what we've been suggested, they had wished for a child, but they've never been blessed with one. They are already old. So when a child yeah. appears as a gift from heaven, this is to me like, and I wanted to relate this back to My Neighbors de Amadas because these themes are continuing. It's about, you know, parenting, about what, like, the parents want to give their child the world in this sense. So what the father thinks about is, well, we're these simple people and we've been blessed by a princess. He himself feels inadequate and not, you know, like he should be able to be blessed with a daughter. And this sort of class inadequacy feeling leads him to interpret the wealth that he's given to as the calling to give her a life that he otherwise could not give her, to give her a high-class life. And what then happens is the father wants her to have that good life, the good life that he in his entire life as a bamboo cutter would never have had, nor could he have ever given it to his children if he had had any. Um, But he was given it from the heavens, so all he can think about is what best to do to make my child happy, even if in his yeah. blindness he doesn't realize that it does not make her happy. But this is like a huge part of the right. movie too. And, and this, this is, is why um... she appears as a princess at first, to already give us the sense that the way he sees his daughter is as a princess. Yeah, that he, he also, of course, receives the gold and, and also some like fine clothes, which I'm not sure is in the original tale. Um, no, that's only gold. That's right. Yeah. Um, and speaking of the original tale, like this is already where we see like what Takahata is doing because this like whole beginning section, like the beginning like third maybe of, of the movie, um, or like yeah, beginning it's quarter, about a third of the runtime. Yeah, um, is dedicated to this like childhood, this like uh, you know speed run childhood. Any percent. Yeah. <laughs> She's called Bamboo Shoot because she grows up real quick. Because yeah, whenever really people quick. look no, at no, her, she extended. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but like yeah yeah. It in in the original tale, it's just like oh, she is born to this like ordinary ba- bamboo cutter, and he is gifted with wealth, and it's like take it for granted, sort of that like okay, palace and like her being a noble woman is like the obvious thing destiny, because she's a right? princess yeah it's a yeah. destiny it's not just a destiny it's just a presumption because like you know exactly it, and that's it, the presumption presume, of yeah. of of the bamboo cutter as well which is coming from his 
you know, lower class position. He he has this presumption because of his station in the world that, you know, he's poor and the nobles and the emperor are rich because that's what each of them deserve. Like that's the, that's what he has bought into. That's kind of his class position that he has subscribed, you know, has, has internalized. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's, it's more to do with like what would make a princess happy. And he, he has all, well, all exactly, these, like, but how he, to he, give your he daughter the best he, life in this world. Yeah. He assumes that yeah. he can't give the best life because he's a peasant. Right. He's yes. internalized that lower class as a, not just a marker of different material means, but a marker of worthiness. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's absolutely true. But what I, what I was also getting at with pointing out how this section is expanded is like, th this is part of Takahata's mission is to like, ask himself, okay, what is happening to this girl who's born? Like, not not the mystical princess who seems, like, wise beyond her years and, and does magic, basically. Like, what, what, if, what if, like, you were, you know, this girl growing up and, like, loving the, these parents and, and living out in the countryside and then, like, th your, the whole thing was just, like, changed on a dime like you, and you had yeah. to be a noble lady um exactly. and, and with that we see like him expanding the uh, uh the like oh and she grew up within a few months and her dad bought a palace expands that to a whole childhood that she spends the rest of the movie like longing for and like dealing with yeah. the loss of Indeed, um, a childhood of yeah. playing with other children, playing with the frogs, you know, mimicking the frogs, of being immersed in real life. And one scene that I find particularly Takahata core in this is the old man, the old bamboo cutter, finds the wealth, right? Like, chops up the uh, bamboo shoots and, like, gemstones and gold pops out. And we cut immediately to a scene of uh, Takenoko, the small hima, right? Watching as uh, the, the rural people are making bowls out of wood. They're, like, having these, these tools and they're, like, holding the wood with their feet and they're, like hacking into the wood in very dangerous looking ways which is like really really authentic but like hard and you know sustainable labor i suppose because it's like mm -hmm. this this labor in harmony with nature and these hard workers this working community and you have this contrasting between the bamboo cutter immediately finding the wealth and be, like you know uh, uh, having fantasies and, of yeah. getting her to a palace contrasted with this more, I guess, Takahata core authentic look at these hard workers in nature, similar to we had how we had in only living, yesterday. Right? Yeah, basically yeah, sustenance he, living. He loves his yeah. farmers as always. The the, yeah. the true dynamic is Miyazaki is always saying you need to touch grass, while Takahata true. is saying you need to cut grass. Yes. No, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, and yeah, man. all those past pastoral scenes with Kaguya and the completely invented for this movie uh, character, what was his name? Uh, Sudamaru. Sudamaru, yeah. Sudamaru, yeah. yeah. Kind of being, in, in these early scenes, we see them like taking care of children, kind of forming like a like a, a, like a a childish makeshift family with her as the, the mother and him as the father, and they're taking care of the younger kids. Yeah. And we see like her kind of, I guess, slowly de de developing an idea of what her life is going to be like. Because yeah, she, she sees the identity. other farmers around her, yeah. What she expects her life to be, essentially, at this point in the story. And, yeah. and this she is, identifies uh, one of the fully. main stages. Where she identifies... She, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying, well, the, when another one of the key scenes where she grows up is where she first meets Sudamaru. She's, like, a, a little, uh, and then he, like, tackles her to get, so she doesn't get killed by a boar. But then, yeah, because uh, she's, like, he she turns little... and she's already grown up a bit. Yeah, and because at least to she me, found I kind the little, of interpreted the, the little that piglets. as like the little piglets were too cute, so she, she yeah, went those to little say piglets hi. were way too cute to be yeah. have such an angry <laughs> ball mother. Yeah. yeah, that's how they get you. That's like the angler yeah, fish. So. They they get you with the dangly <laughs> thing, and then they kill you. But yeah, when she meets Sudamaru, she grows up, and I kind of interpreted that as another like spurt in her growing up, as in you know like you know meeting boys. She's now like kind of met someone who we know throughout the rest of the story is kind of like a love interest of hers or like someone she's very close to and she's kind of like the first person that like 
Yeah. He is the first person, I mean, that she is close to. So we get that little growing up moment again. And with him, yeah. she there also is... experiences Takahata's favorite pastime, stealing fruit from the fields. Mm, that's true, yeah. Love that, that <laughs> melon. Um, that was a, literally a big part of the documentary about Takahata, thinking the melons have that to look right. That particular shot, yeah. They have to look oh, cut yeah. properly. Yeah, they brought oh, melons and knives into the studio and they like, stood around with the entire animation team like, okay, let's look how we cut this melon. And they like try it until they figured out how to do it. Yeah, things about like, where do you place the knife on the rind to like most carefully and with the most control, like insert the blade. And then how fast does the blade go into the melon? And then because you don't want to cut all the way through with the knife because you could cut your hand, you 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 pry yeah. you know you and cut like halfway it's... and then pry it open and it splits cleanly in half and how does it snap you know and what does the yeah, inside like, look like T- takahata's like 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 p- very particular about like it's in fact like this one scene in the grave of the fireflies where uh the the the, the big brother like is cutting a watermelon and he's just like still not over how like how it doesn't look exactly right it, it looks yeah too it's like it gives him nightmares still yeah <laughs> It's, it's like the one it that looks got like away. tofu. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what he yeah. said about his, the only. We got to fix like, that. Yeah, it's terrible. yeah, and I, I think that's a that's a great little thing about about this movie is like uh, it is like stylized uh, as all hell uh, and like looks like be- absolutely beautiful, but there but it still has this like weight and character to all the movements. There's still oh, this yeah. this reality that uh, that he's background. really striving for. Uh, yeah, and he... something he talks about a bit is like this balance mm-hmm. where, and he talks about it with the My Name is the Yamadas as well, where when when you like stylize and you um, you simplify, you remove things, then you need to have some like level of grounding in yeah. the animation, like uh, to clearly communicate mm. and, and clearly like spark the imagination of like what it r- really is. Yeah. So, th- so yeah. There's so a good his quote main from thing. actually on the uh, yeah. the animation and the artistry of the movie where he says he wanted viewers to to recall their memories and kind of stir their imagination and like um, give themselves over to like a comfortable world. So he like yeah he says he wants mm-hmm. it to be familiar and like based in reality, like a lot of like you know like small subsistence farming, but then also like it has this this ethereal element, the massive amounts of like white space. And uh, uh, un- le- de- things left undetailed. There's this yeah, the, thing there's about a cool, yeah. There's a cool quote, uh, which is from the same interview that Ipsor was just talking about, but that I think is cool as a reflection back on why Takahata wanted to use this style both in the backgrounds and in the animation and not the normal Ghibli style and why he really was insistent that it could not be that that other style. He said, if one wants to show audiences a fantastic world that no one has seen or present strange characters and wants them to believe in that world, one needs to create a specific space and place within it solid objects, rich in shading, drawn as intricately as possible. Basically, you know, it's it's to convince people that the world is real. And then he continues, but the aim of the work I wanted to create is different. That is the world that that world is this one that we know and the characters who appear in it are normal human beings. And the drama that unfolds there is of the conflicts that occur within normal everyday life. So because he extracts uh, a lot of the excess detail, because he doesn't need to convince people that this is the real world. So he he sort of, you know, allows it to, to breathe and the imaginations of the audiences fill yeah. in the gaps with you know real sort of cultural memory yeah the the empty spaces are there for you to recognize the essence of the thing takahara has also during only yesterday in a way talked about how he thinks animation can bring something truer out of the thing that we might have forgotten by just depicting it but he seems to have radicalized that style because as we know only <laughs> yesterday had excruciatingly realistic backgrounds and he was still convinced that animating it in this way would bring out something true. But I think he's latched onto that idea even more now in the same style that he used during the Only Yesterday 
flashback mm-hmm. scenes, right? Like the empty space, yeah. the f- scenes that fade into whiteness and like the unfinished lines sometimes and the mm-hmm. uh, scribbled style, which truly seems to capture the moment. This is his attempt of allowing the viewer to project everything they know, their own experiences onto the images and thus arriving at a truer depiction of a thing. Then, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, and it, it really harkens back to like one of the like, like w- one of the like complicated and, and like old and deep seated things in like Japanese culture and art. This like idea of of, of the gaps um, of of ma of uh, and, and to some extent to some extent mono no aware. This um, the the idea that like the the empty spaces, the gaps, the pauses, uh, the things that are not there is part of the uh, is part of the art and right. doesn't just like punctuate the uh the work but is like uh part of it like the um, empty space between two haikus in a collection of haikus exactly that is the ma or the pillow shots used by ozu which uh, takahara also famously uses where there's a yeah. moment of pause of emptiness of calm between two things and, and, and i actually i actually just ha- had a thought that like um in uh, my neighbors, the Yamadas, when, when we discussed that, uh, w- one of my like problems with it is like that it felt like it, like uh, it, it it mistook the normal for the universal. Uh, that that it like sort of took this like really not great status quo and like turned it into some sort of like universal truth. And I think that comes in large part from from the style because it is so simplified. It it becomes like almost uh, like symbolic or almost like uh made holy in some weird like way mm. and i think actually the tale of the princess kaguya fixes a lot of those problems not just by like um just being in, in my opinion just a better written more like th- thematically consistent movie but also by matching the style to the uh to the subject really yeah. really really well like what? He's, yeah yeah he's inv- evoking these like old art styles and and old and, and really old japanese cultural notions to like literally the oldest thing you know he, and, that and the this by the way story i like that you draw a connection to my neighbors the amadas again and i also want to do it like i agree with you that the way in which the themes are handled there's so much overlap to my neighbors the amadas but there's also through the shift of focus in the ways that we will discuss probably during the next acts such a criticality added to the whole narrative um, but one thing I still want to mention is that during the scene in my neighbors the amadas where we have this basically roller coaster ride of life one thing that happens is that actually images from uh, the story of the, the tale of the bamboo cutter are used to express the this couple married and they had a child and the child appears as like a little girl in a bamboo shoot right like that was imagery used already in my neighbor's day amados to express like life uh, while the, the 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 song was sung like que sera, sera, you know yeah that's life yeah. basically I think it's fitting because uh and I, th- I think the disconnect platon was kind of with you for my neighbor's yamada is like yeah uh, the yamadas is like a bit too specific uh culturally because it was like uh just a newspaper comic that like was i guess popular in japan like the 80s you know so that's not not a lot of people are going to get that i wonder when miyazaki's gonna animate uses... garfield yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> but he more broadly uses the tale of the bamboo cutter to a to be like a much more like uh, like cultural nostalgia because like we say for only yeah. yesterday he used it in the flashback sequences. It's like the whole of Kaguya is rendered in this way to be like this kind of collective flashback for the whole audience about you know a story they all heard when they were children. Yeah, and brought I- in this kind of vague way. Speaking of which, and, and kind of bringing it back to the, the pastoral life uh, yes. part of, of the movie, uh, I think it's a Susan Napier text where, where she compares the two and basically points out that Kaguya is like kind of a, a reverse only yesterday, where the mm-hmm. protagonist like starts out in this like idealized pastoral world and then like is removed from it and is like deeply nostalgic for it and can't go back. Whereas in in only yesterday the protagonist, uh, like, l- grows up in this like 
like unsatisfying a, a, and has become an adult in this like sort of unsab- unsatisfying urban suburban world and uh, she m- like modern. goes to yeah modern yeah uh, and and goes to this like idealized pastoral life to to like get get away from that get towards and something she's more drawn ideal. there because of a cultural memory that is that is yeah, with yeah. her that has become somewhat like almost mythologized before she actually goes there and experiences it for herself but that you know Takahara very much is coming at it as from the from the perspective that this is kind of part of who we are uh because it's where we came from and it never has left us even the children who grew up in this world of modernity you know alienated from that place and both movies end with the main character sitting in a carriage, a train carriage, you know, <laughs> yesterday, and uh, the Buddha's weird cloud carriage at the end. I okay, that, that's stuff. true. That, that was the most important connection. Right, yes, that, that, that's clearly intentional, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> to, I mean, the, the image of, of carriages and trains, of course, is always marking a transition, a changing mm-hmm. from one place to another, a liminality, you know, we, we explored mm-hmm. liminal spaces a lot. Uh, yeah. But definitely... Yeah, and, yeah. The, and also uh, trains and carriages to death. That's like, you know, I bring them up again. Ozu, a uh, Tokyo story, like train rides are often also into death, literally. Yeah. Hmm. Or figuratively, like in, I guess, not literally. In spirited away, you know. You have right. the, the train station, which you pass through in order to get to the spirit realm. And anyways, the the background art of this pastoral section is extremely, even though it is more sparse in terms of it's not as finely detailed, it is extremely colorful and evocative. And it it really, one of the the, uh, sort of symbolisms of the language of this film is in the use of colors or their absence, right? And this early pastoral section, right, it represents for Takenoko the ideal of what life on earth has to offer. It is this period of freedom, this period of, you know... Being in tune with nature. The fullness, yeah, being in tune with nature, but also just the fullness of individuality, of, you know, if you have a desire, you act on it. There is no, um, you know, there's no decorum. There's no, th- that is that is restricting one's behavior. There's no expectations on what cannot be done. Um, and instead, just absolute freedom and fullness in living. Yeah. There's energy behind it. You know, there in that pastoral section, you know, Takenoko is always just running around and romping around with these other kids. They're hopping over stones and over little, over streams and climbing on cliffs and falling down and getting hurt and, you know, stealing food and eating the food and really, you know. Collecting food, being excited to cook the food the next day and eat with everyone. Yeah. Um, It's all of these things that are very, they're very just, they are sustenance, but it is because they are the sustenance of life that they have so much fullness in them, that they are truly, like, living, you know? And that she's basically always smiling. She's so happy and joyous to live in this way, in this section. And there's so much color to the backgrounds and to, you know, it doesn't look like your plain brown anime, like dirt. Like, this is nature. It's just dirt and trees. No, it's... It's so full. There's so much fecundity to the oh nature. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. To bring out the, 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 the yeah. thesaurus there. And also, important to mention the color. Uh, another little production note is that they didn't have a set color palette like a lot of anime will have, and the colorists will go off that. The, like mm-hmm. Takahata insisted on like choosing the colors for each individual scene to try to like match a tone to it. So yeah. that's why, yeah, a lot of these early scenes are much more brighter colors, while the others seem a bit more dour. And yeah, then, exactly, because um, it it goes, you know, in the idea of like the moon and the whiteness of like the snowy landscape when she 
later comes back to the countryside but has to go back to her court life. It, there's this, the, the color represents the fullness of life and when she loses that color uh yeah it, uh, it, it's the loss implied. that is yeah. yeah there's well there's yeah. there's a loss there it, it happens there's a foreshadowing of it before she goes back to the moon like there's even foreshadowing of that sort of yeah, stark that, that whiteness is. let's talk um, about the um should, should we talk the about background that artist kazuo Oga. So oh yeah that uh doing the background for this movie is also pretty hard because they're all beautiful but watercoloring is like he says that is inconsistent so you'll try to draw the same background twice, but it'll come out different, which yeah, I think almost kind of fits the, the vagueness that we say, the ethereal sense of this movie. Well, he said, uh, I love this, which I think this goes, uh, I'm glad that you brought up Kazuo Oga because, you know, this film is very much rooted in this collaborative process. Takahata is very much a collaborator, right? And he ex he is relying on his collaborators to bring him inspiration rather than him being the only one to dole out inspiration to others. Um, with Kazuo Oga, he also, you know, is really famous for all these backgrounds like in Moi de Poro Poro and uh, My Neighbor Totoro and has done, you know, background art for many Ghibli films that are recognized for having just absolutely gorgeous background art however he was like at first intrigued and excited by this project of uh, Takahata when when Takahata is like oh yeah it's going to be really simple there's going to be lots of white space and much less detail and Oga was like oh that'll be nice like it'll be it'll be it'll be fresh but it'll also be you know more simple and and thus easy to produce <laughs> And how wrong he was because to to the point that Hipster was making, you know, the watercolor backgrounds, you can't paint over them. Once you have put the, you know, the brush to the paper, the water is there. It can't be painted over by a different color because it's just going to, it's just going to stain it. It's not actually going to cover it like oil paints would. Um, so if you make mistakes, you have to start over. And not only are you starting over because of mistakes, but because Takahata is saying, no, nope, this background won't work for the scene. So do a different one and let me see what I, if, I, if I think it works. And so it was really grueling work, but obviously the background art in this film is just absolutely stunning. So it was worth, I think, every ounce of effort, but, uh, you know, Kazuo Oga's tenacity at... I mean, producing this new kind of art for an animated film um, is is just so important to the to the visual language of the film. Yeah. Also, shout out to that dude who had to make the three D backgrounds by getting one of those watercolor paintings and like oh, etching yeah. out every single tree. There were like two hundred of them. Yeah, and he yeah just had to digitally spend his time extract. Doing that. Yeah. In the, in the place like some theme. heroes of the production. Yeah. But back to the act one, I, th I think I want to yeah. talk about one aspect to act one, which is how the moon, the moon people in a way already interfere or appear within this act. Within this act. Mm -hmm. This has to do with my big reading of what the moon signifies, um, aside from, you know, the things that Takahata says it is signified, but more, more so. The first thing that I found interesting is when the children all sing the song and uh, Kaguya or Takenoko, sorry, uh, knows the lyrics and she continues singing and everyone just pauses and listens to her sing as she's crying because it continues the song that starts to be about like, you know, the birds, the, the insects, the animals around us, the world and so on that you experience. Yeah, the seasons. But then yeah. the song goes into how she has to return at some point and that it is uh, it was a time for her to learn about this world and so on. It like foreshadows this entire moon people thing. The, the thing that sh her experience in this world is transient and that she mm -hmm. knows at the end of the cycle, basically, she has to go. She doesn't really yeah. realize this yet, but she's already crying. She knows... Basically, in this song, this is already codified, that she has come to see the world and then has to leave at some point, which in a way, of course, is how we all live life. But for yeah. uh, her, it is accelerated as to make it a sort of simile or metaphor for life 
in general, like mm. the fa the the being immersed into a natural, rich world which you observe and learn and experience only for you yeah. then to at some point have to leave. And what's interesting in this act, the leaving that happens in this act also comes from the moon because as we know, Takenoko has to leave the forest. Her family moves to a palace. But why? Well, it is really important to me to highlight why the father, why the bamboo cutter thinks he has to take her away. It's because, he's, because sent, he yeah, he's sent riches. And to him, he says, they're sending me gold, gems, fancy clothes. This means I have to make her a princess worthy of wearing these clothes. But where does it come from? And I'm asking this in a very like simplistic way. It comes from above. The moon is like towering from above mm -hmm. and gives its decree from heaven. down to the people of Earth to tell the bamboo cutter, hey, this is how you treat our moon girl, right? This ties deeply into how I interpret the moon and the, you know, heavenly entourage that appears in the last act. But here for me, it is hierarchy from above that commands, you know, in a way, or hegemony in a way that what is appropriate as a, you know, life, as happiness, and so on. And we, mm -hmm. we later learn, too, that the moon people don't really have a full understanding of what happiness means. And yeah. uh, I think this is already a sign of things to come, that what takes her away from what actually makes her happy is the moon people sending the riches. In a way, yeah, that, that's almost this... unearned riches, right? Well, I want to... Well, I, wanna... I mean, not, not any, like, less... Uh, oh, n not not any like less earned than uh, the the wealth of like the emperor and, and yeah, yeah the that's nobles. exactly that's, my that's point. That's a whole other. That's exactly that's, my that's point. Though, yeah. Discussion. Because exactly because it it, I think that there's a, um, a slight alteration to this reading that I would I would like to propose, which is that the moon people, it's as you say they they don't have an understanding of what happiness means. They they don't understand why one of their own would choose a material life of suffering and, you know, emotions and material concerns. Uh, and so they send these things, which are, you know, this, like, overt wealth as, like, a very obvious, you know, gift to her so that, you know, she can get what she set out to get basically that's their interpretation but this combines with this uh societal uh you know the the, the societal uh structure to to lead the father to believe that you know uh she, he she has to be become a noble because it is in the um you know, it, it's it's the justification of the emperor and of this society that those with wealth have their wealth because they are blessed by heaven. Yes. Right? That's not there an alteration this... that is my reading. Thank you for expanding oh, on it. Okay, great. Because <laughs> it is, it I is think a rumination that... on nobility, right? Because right. nobility is granted by the heavens because you are chosen by God. And this explains why you have exuberant wealth and get to live as princesses and palaces and all Though that. Though I want to, I like give this you know i i guess i want what i wanted to uh spe specifically uh look at was how really i don't believe that the heaven does not have a plan for kaguya in giving these gifts i i don't believe that i i believe that it's entirely the construct it's it's meant to be the construct of the you know the systems of power that are in this, you know, the world that interprets this just good fortune as a, you know, divine destiny. Because there is this, um, there's no, there's no, you know, the, the idea that she was, uh, you know, needed to become a princess is one that the father constructs because of the, uh, you know, hierarchy of society. Yes. I, yeah, for me, this, the um, moon is kind of symbolic of a kind of hierarchy of society. But we'll get into that when we get into, mm, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll, I guess the we'll last get there when act. We get there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But th th there, is this, there is this implication that, like, the 
the the life uh, life on the moon and and the people of the moon like live similarly to the nobles in, in that they are like free from worry uh, and and like live like tra- tranquil and rigid lives uh, although like the reason for mm. that is because they do not experience like memory and emotion and and thus like uh, regrets but in the same way they don't experience joy and so like i i, I like the the most charitable like interpretation of like the moon people and how they they act to, with uh, with giving those gifts is that they don't understand that there is like something joyous about living that rural life living that like subsistence life uh like just working the land so uh, yeah, yeah. they like they like g- give them a leg up and uh, and are like hey have an easier life We have worry. class again, right? The moon people yeah. don't yeah. understand that suffering makes builds character. Haha, <laughs> you know, it makes, makes you life human. richer, makes you human. In the same way that all nobles, absolutely all nobles in this movie are depicted as unable to empathize with with Kagria as a person, right? So yeah. the the parallel well, well, here is that basically um it is a class commentary from Takahata, all right? Like it is okay. there's something basic, something real, something authentic about the life in the this rural pastoral thing. Even if these children are poor, even if they have to steal sometimes and you know, get up to all sorts of trouble. But this builds a real authentic personality versus the, you know, hierarchical and strong expectations of the higher classes that basically just mm-hmm. live a performance of being high class rather than yeah. you know living um yeah they're trying to be we... incredibly pompous and stupid like the scene where yeah. they're all walking <laughs> in a line with the um the long robes and they're all like pacing uh quite slowly just as some sort of like weird traditional way to walk about like like so impractical and stupid but just yeah. shows how much abundance of like wealth and privilege they have and they're also and they're not doing this absorbed by their identity right like they yeah, yeah. they just other think themselves. of themselves as nobles mm. and nobles mm. have to act this way noble ladies yeah. have to act this. and we'll get i actually we're already talking about act two in a way yeah. so yeah. let's just but briefly do, do the transition, transition right <laughs> because yeah, for me we, yeah play but before please. we actually one thing before we move like on to to the palace uh Uh, I uh, want to uh, touch back on the uh, the, the song uh, how, how you mentioned it, uh, yeah. uh, Nyad, and and it foreshadowing everything. Um, like the music in the movie, especially like uh, and and that scene in particular, like really mm-hmm. um, really clarifies this genre as tragedy, because the like obviously anyone of the intended audience of, of like the Japanese audience knows this story and how it ends uh, and probably doesn't expect it to like go differently. But, uh, but it, so it is like, we know ahead of time that this will not end with a happy ever after. This will end with, uh, with regrets and with parting. Um, and the, the, the choices made to like, indicate that uh, like uh, from near the very beginning there where she has this sadness in her that she doesn't can't exactly place but it comes out in this music which is like so like uh, such an like artistic and ethereal and brings about like uh, evocative it, it evokes emotion um and and it's, it's like a through line of uh, uh Kaguya's life Where she she, uh, she plays the uh, what's it called the the, the shamisen no that's koto. not it koto. the koto the koto yeah uh, she plays the koto uh, as a way of like expressing this exact like implacable melancholy uh, throughout. There's a moment in the making of documentary where um, in the second half where Joe Hisaishi is like making the score, and um, and 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 during the scene where she is running uh, like first like realizes she's going to live in a palace and have all this beautiful clothes and she's running around um originally uh he says she makes uh, a like happy melody like from this childish naive perspective that oh like this seems fun and Takahata like uh, goes against that and says well no I I don't actually want it from her perspective I want music that indicates that like this is not a happy thing this is like we're on our way to tragedy and yeah. he says she it, it changes it and 
th that's just like such an important little choice and and like it's these choices with uh with music and motifs that just add up and and create this um this tone of like foreboding melancholy and you know just tragedy that really really pays off by by the uh, the ending scenes oh yeah uh, another example of that the motivic musical motivic uh you know uh language going along with the theming is her it, and it goes right into what we're talking about with this pastoral act really setting up what what takenoko could have had in the fullness of life if she had experienced that um and why her loss both in moving to the capital and then eventually in going back to the moon why it it feels so painful and why she longs for that again and uh he, you know another scene which takahara asked hisaishi to redo the music was the flight scene at the end and i'm not going to get into that scene but what takahara eventually you know what what hisaishi eventually did and what takahara you know uh liked was that hisaishi reuses the the theme the motive from her life as a child in the country this simple happy idyllic life and repurposes it in that you know flight scene where uh when kaguya is reflecting on her on the life that could have been and it's da 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 it's it's fucking just so good ah. yeah it's it's like <laughs> it's such a great theme but anyway i wanted to bring that up cuz yeah he yeah, saw score for this film is it's um it's I think really it's wonderful it I I don't I, this I can't is, this say is a that. tough one played. That's I, a tough one. That's <laughs> a really tough one. The, but the it's thing, done yeah. in a way that is different than his than his scores for Miyazaki films. His scores for Miyazaki films are very romantic. There's a lot of um, very like strong like light motif in there. A lot of times it's Wagnerian. It's big. It's 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 powerful. It can be uh, bombastic. Yeah. Um, and this one is a lot more subtle. With pathos. This is much more subtle. This is, and he, and 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 to that effect, he uses a lot more folk uh, instruments and and sparser instrumentation and and lighter textures in the music, and he doesn't give, he doesn't use at, uh, hardly any like pathos driven melodies, but it's much more. Uh, it's much more light and folk-like and uh, is just, as Takahata says in the documentary, he, he he was looking for music that would sort of fill in the cracks and not take over the scene, but just sort of exist there so to kind of give this background of, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, destiny and the, the kind of tale that it is and less so about the emotionality of the characters but obviously the film is very con concerned with Kaguya's inner inter, uh, like inner um identity and emotionality but the score is kind of setting it apart yeah the, the, yeah the, a lot the like the art is, of the movie we say yeah. is ethereal and vague i think you're right the score does that as well I don't know if he uses any actual traditional instruments or it's just the strings in the song kind of sound yeah, they're used similar that to way. how you would imagine yeah. like this story being told in like a medieval court, you know, like it's simplistic, but still has that. Well, there's a lot of Koto, like he does use the Koto a lot, but right, yeah. yeah. And, and there's, or, you know, there's, uh, and oriental Kankia percussion is like and musically gifted like is such like an important part of her as well. Mm -hmm. It's like her spirit that she always kind of like holds to herself. Because like we see that, yeah, she's naturally born with the song and everything. I think it's it's through music yeah. that she communicates this, uh, uh, the memory of, you know, her lost 
we'll get into the mm. music scenes a bit more Potential. when we go into Act yeah. Two, Act Four, yeah. and you know Act Five, I guess too. Uh, but first, uh, one brief thing about Joe Hisaishi again. This is the first time that uh, Takahata and Joe Hisaishi work together on a movie, yeah. and this was actually a long time coming and a huge thing for Joe Hisaishi because back when Hisaishi was cast for Nausicaa to make the the, the uh, Nausicaa. The Nausicaa Valley of the Wind uh, uh, <laughs> OST. Um, he was a relatively unknown composer. He had a few anime under his belt, and it was actually Takahata who suggested Joe Hisaishi to Miyazaki. And since hmm. then, Joe Hisaishi has been thankful to Takahata for basically starting his entire career and the thing he would become incredibly famous for, which is, you know, this creative collaboration mainly with Hayao Miyazaki. But now, finally, and not just you know, finally, but also on this really important film in Takahata's career, his last film, Hisaishi can thank the person who basically made his career, right? That this is wow. like a pretty amazing undertow. And Hisaishi was I aware of no that idea too. About that. Yeah. yeah, of course he would. He must have been. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, in, in the documentary, you really get this sense that while uh, Takahata is kind of particular and a bit difficult to work with that Hisaishi just had so much uh, enthusiasm for working with him and and was just really excited to be able to do that. Um, and I just, I really admire his professionalism as somebody who is so, like, you know, accomplished in his field and yet he's putting up with Takahata being like, yeah, that piece you wrote... I no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no thanks. Several times too. Yeah, like he's, he's like sitting there by the piano and and it's like, wait, so does that mean I'm gonna have to like, so I need to write an entirely new melody? Yes. And like, yeah, probably. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and that's like, oh my god, I'm sure that any film, you know, like film score composers, uh, would find that ink incredibly difficult but Hisaishi is just like so patient and such the professional and he just he's like yeah this is the way this you know he works and I'm here for it so yeah. um and he's really adaptable in that way so he is adaptable well, anyways like if you listen to some other Joe Hisaishi especially 80s OSTs mm -hmm. like he's done some like banging electronic beats oh yeah and, lots like, of synth you know, stuff synth stuff as Nausicaa all has a lot of yeah. synths. The, the original version of the OST, yes. I think there was a remaking of the OST for later releases done by Hisaishi yeah. as well. Interesting enough. Um, there were like two versions of the Nausicaa OST. Very, very interesting little history thing about that. Um, really? Basically, oh, as the budget yeah. increased, they just went with an orchestral soundtrack later. Right. It, it's pretty neat uh, that you have these two different versions uh, to compare. Um... But yeah, this is the thing about Hisaishi. So for now, I actually want us want to get us back on track. Well, because yeah. we're already spilling over on <laughs> Act 2 a lot. I want to end Act 1 on what it actually ends on, at least uh, in the way mm -hmm. we think of it. It's when they all are out collecting food, finding the mushrooms and, you know... The pheasant. Uh, the pheasant yeah. that uh, 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 Sutomaru kills like a chad like a giga chad or something I don't know. It's, like, it's like a really alpha, th like alpha a giga scene. and then the girl falls it. in his arms <laughs> yeah basically and he's like don't he do that and falls onto it like a true master and, of hunting and he tries to be like a tough man type type of person yeah. where it's like nah don't worry about my wounds I, i'm gonna spit in it later and that's gonna make it like, <laughs> yeah and and when when he catches uh takenoko and then she stands up she has grown yet again it's like yeah. it's almost as if she's kind of responding to this um you know it's it's a pretty heteronormative dynamic but the uh there is some sexual maturation that happens in that scene we're probably going to get into some, the dynamics I, I actually, between them a bit later because there's a cool equalizing moment way later. And I'm actually going to say it now before we forget. Because later in the fantasy scene, when she returns to see Sutomaru mm -hmm. all grown up as an adult, there's a moment where he picks her up and she says, no, I can walk Yeah, tries own. to princess carry her. Yeah. And she says <laughs> yeah. no, and then they start flying. And this is the yeah, moment like, where I feel like, together. yeah. 
they're actually yeah. also reflecting on Sutomaro's like manly man behavior that he shows as like a young teen here, and they reflect on that in that scene. I feel like, yeah, which yeah. is really I neat. Like I think that's a cool engagement with that. I would like to mention. I, I don't. I don't think I see it as much as like uh, that sexual maturation. I, I think she grows every time she makes a new connection or learns a new lesson. But she grows um, a, a couple of times with Sutomaro, so I guess yeah, she, something she, she does. That. But but like the uh, first time is when she goes to see the little piglets and the boar comes after her and he saves her. She grows a bit because like that's part of childhood is like making mistakes and learning from them. And I feel like that's also a, like a, uh, an ongoing thing in her like big growth spurt at the start of the uh, at the start with uh, with the frogs and uh, and with like she begins to crawl when she becomes curious about these things mm-hmm. um which like again part of like part of growing up she you know f- falls uh like fr- from the like uh from, from the house floor to to the ground outside and she gets up and she's fine that's a growing experience like i th- i think it's yeah. simply just like uh th- maybe that's sexual like maturation the, was the wrong way to put it but it is she's She's growing to, uh, because she wants to be more of his equal, his companion. Oh, yeah, that that might be something, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah and because she, he tells her not to come down the cliff, it's dangerous, and she's like, screw that, I'm coming down anyway. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, my arm doesn't hurt at all. She's like, sure it doesn't. So it's kind of her, you know, learning to stand up for herself yeah. In a way to take care of others, you know, like yeah. learning to become a bit selfless. Yeah, and then she, you know, she rips her, you know, uh, cloth and bandages him up, you know, sort of in this caring role. She's she's like, hey, you know, like you don't have to be all macho. Yeah, stop being yeah. weird. Really, really <laughs> sweet. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so they 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 gather all that stuff. She grows a little bit, and there's this like little oh, there's there's some like budding childhood friend romance thing, be like the 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 seeds of it. And she gets back, and it's like oh my god, there's gonna be a big feast, and it's gonna be fun. We're gonna, it's gonna eat be all the good food from the land, all the good food, uh, all, the nabe yeah. with like mushrooms and pheasant. Mm, hell yeah! Hell yeah, man. Get hungry just thinking about it. And then uh, her parents are like, nah, get in the carriage. Get in the carriage, we're leaving. And they yeah. literally, like, this is the shot that this act ends on. The shot of the food that they're going to eat, uh, th- that they were going to eat together, being left behind because they're leaving right then and there. Almost yeah. as though the nourishment of uh, an idealized pastoral existence, the, like nourishment for the body and soul, Gets left behind for some materialistic ideal, but you know. Yep. Or yep. you can yeah. leave food out in the open when you're rich, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> that too, kind of <laughs> right. Too. Like the idea how precious this food was. Her parents now with the newfound wealth are way beyond that. This isn't precious in in that way to them anymore. But because this is the kind of distinction that you know is brought about by this abundant wealth, like the. I guess, the lack of valuing these little things. And it's not out of malice. Like, they're genuinely thinking, hey, we're getting out of this shithole. We're giving our daughter a great life now. So let's let's go there as soon as we can. Well, I, I want to say they do. there is the difference between the father and the mother. The, fa- the mother just goes along with yeah, she, she the father's sad. wishes. But, but, she, but she doesn't believe that, you know, her life as a peasant is any less good than the noble's life and we see that later on but you know uh we do see the mother being sad even in this first act like the idea that they'll yeah. have to leave saddens her we have a scene of that mm-hmm. it is true yeah but it's yeah. like going along with the father because he has such a strong notion of how it would be the best for their daughter and that is also yeah. what the mother basically then accepts and he's the patriarch so you follow him like that's just yeah. that's just the way of the world. Yeah. Then after they leave the food behind, we enter what we call act 2. So it's not actually divided into acts in the movie in the text itself. It's just for our convenience that we sort of divide it up to make it because they're also distinct little parts of the story that have their own 
ideas to them. Because what happens in Act 2 is that now that uh, the bamboo cutter has bought a palace and built up a palace and has hired like serfs and, you know, a teacher for Kaguya and all of that, they, you know, start appreciating the life at court. Well, we can, or the, the, the noble life is, I guess, how, should, how I should put it. They're not, they're not literally at court, um, but they're living like, like nobles with serfs and all that. I like to call this part patriarchy, baby. Yeah, so it, it gets pretty bad, but it starts out nice enough because when Kaguya, uh, well, she's not named Kaguya yet, right? But she has left Takenoko behind, basically, by leaving nature and entering this foreign world. And I really like how she appears because it mirrors the sort of um, otherworldliness of how she first appeared in the bamboo shoot because she wakes up in the carriage and she, the first thing she sees when she wakes up is these women who are basically like uh, like like behaving like ladies should but what this means is that they're all like alien creatures in a way like uh, their face made yeah. white their eyebrows removed and they're all like hunched over a little bit and walking in a weird way and they bow to her in an unnatural way and what the initial scenes of arriving here depict is that she Hema doesn't fit in at all like she moves differently she behaves differently she sees them in a sort of weird way and doesn't really know what to make of them and this is already like thematically in the visuals alone like f pre uh, establishing the entire theme of this second act which is you know all about how a lady should behave at this court yeah. and all about she, she how literally they are strange she literally trips over her Tudor, like the the thing that's going to be the c conflict for for the future, you know? Yeah, yeah that's Saga, true. me, the Tudor. But before she realizes how strict everything is going to be, she has a lot of fun. Like, at first she sees all the abundant kimonos that she'll be able to wear and she, like, enjoys throwing them about in the ass. Like, yeah, all yeah. these fancy clothes are all for me. She sees her parents who are, like have makeup on them like as if they were nobles like this really interesting like weird makeup that kind of looks like clowns and like Hima <laughs> when realizing it's my parents starts laughing you know because it's funny to her and she thinks that's really funny yeah. and she has some fun messing around with her teacher with Sagami who is supposed to teach her how to behave like a lady and it's like here see play this koto and she just fucks around on the koto and then when the teacher doesn't you know uh, when she isn't alone with the teacher anymore, she suddenly like belts out like a fucking guitar solo on the koto because <laughs> she's so amazing at it. Like she has some fun at first. It's a novel mm -hmm. thing for her to at first experience this material abundance and all the fancy things and all the These strange traditions. Cultural... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe Takata said that uh, again in trying to be very earnest to Kaguya's uh, or Hime's. Uh, feelings and how a real girl would like emotionally re emotionally react to this she is excited to be in a new place in like a big expensive palace with all the clothes she could ever want and like just you know messing about not having a care in the world so she is you know like we do we do begin to see the oppression taking shape but it's like uh there's still kind of an earnest fun to be had in it i think the key the key uh scene to set to set the conflict is is that first scene when she arrives there as, and and she gets the robes and then she starts to run and frolic about and she is having so much fun and she's basically treating that environment just as she would treat her environment back home in the countryside um as a place to climb and explore like he she climbs on the railings and stuff like that and she gets underneath the um the the sort of uh floorboards and crawls around and then yeah, immediately the yeah immediately when she you know trips over sagami for one thing sagami doesn't even react like as someone you would expect that she's gonna get mad right no no she's just Ever the you know graceful and you know poised uh, noble lady you know so she it, it it's here that we see uh, you know what Nyard was talking about about how this nobility 
sort of has the airs of being detached from the material world, detached from, you know, earthly uh, emotions. And, you know, she she is like, yeah, we, we I, I won't have an outburst. And she tells um, <clears throat> Hime, she tells Hime, you know, a, a, a noble lady does not frolic and things like that. It's like, but I want to frolic. But no, you can't because that's not how a noble lady should act. And so we we immediately have these new expectations placed this, on Hime. Yeah. And this is how we get into all the transitions, right? Like Because now she's basically still Takenoko, but everyone tells her she cannot be that. And her parents have already started performing a different role. Uh, I find one thing really funny. It's that her father insists on wearing this stupid hat, even though he'll <laughs> run into door frames every time with the stupid hat and it will always fall off his head. And he'll put it back on, even though, you know, next time he goes through a door, it will again fall off. It's yeah, this, he's he's yeah. a nouveau riche. Uh, he's a, uh, yeah, the father's quite a Gatsby esque character in that sense, <laughs> in which he's he's constantly striving to transcend his class, but uh, always critically failing, no matter how much he tries to you know uh, put on these pompous kind of airs. Which is exactly why it's so impressive that the first scene we see him in this new palace is him performing, like overacting like a theater uh, uh, actor and having yeah. makeup on and all of that to highlight Shipping sort of the words. performative dimension of class. And Th those the hats are important as well. I think we'll come back to those hats later. And the, the thing that the thing is, like, uh, will we? Uh, Kaguya actually. Um, Kaguya actually. Like, it's really, really good at that performance once she learns it. Like, once she sets her mind to it, she seems to have, like, she has this, like, poise about her. And, and she's excellent at, at the ko uh, Koto. And, um, uh, like, she, she takes to it when when she decides to take to it. Um, yeah, she's and, an like, exceptionally yeah. bright child. Like Exactly, exactly. And, and I... There's, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. I think that it's important to to make clear that her brightness, although she is ob like she is an otherworldly being originally, she's she has lived, she's been raised as, and she has lived, and she's come to identify as just a normal human being, which is, you know, highlighted when they want to you know, pluck her eyebrows and paint her teeth black and paint her face white and then, you know, draw on the makeup. She's like, I, you know, I don't want to to go through that because it, it seems alien. It seems othering. And, you know, the insagami is always insisting like, oh, a noble lady cannot have these kinds of outbursts. And, uh, you know, Hime responds, then a noble lady isn't human. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you got you got that right, uh, Kaguya. You got that right. But that's the point, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that exactly. Is, uh... So, and the ways in which a noble lady is not human uh, are, there's a couple different angles to that. And we'll get the, into that when when it comes to the coming of age. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely yeah, she, she, one way immediately, which is that they look otherworldly and strange with mm -hmm. the makeup and black teeth, and yeah, that know, performativity. They're not allowed as you to said. laugh out loud. Yeah, this, they uh, don't then. sweat. They don't laugh. All of this, right? Like ladies aren't supposed to sweat. Ladies aren't supposed to laugh. So it doesn't matter that you find these black teeth wrong yeah. because they, they, you know, they move. They move about uh, very restricted under like many layers of clothing and they're on supposed their knees. to like walk on their knees yeah. to get things, you know, physically restricting their like range of movements um, yeah. when it's in public. Like limitation of freedom. It's and 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 now, you know, as a noble maiden, you know, uh, yeah. Hime is placed in this palace separate from the rest of the world. She She has no contact with the rest of the world. Yeah, and she's not even allowed to be seen, which is like the most absurd one, almost. Mm -hmm. Like, the the whole like, she her doesn't naming exist. Party. She feels she feels yeah. that. Yeah, that that's 
one uh, really uh, interesting thing that was um, uh, was pointed out in a, a, a David J. Bradley, this YouTuber, has has a video uh, on Kaguya Hime where, where like one of the things he points out is that um, so true to the original fairy tale, uh, the uh, the bamboo cutter gets this guy who's uh, like a namer, like he he's a like old nobleman yeah, and his he, name is Inbe no Akita. Yeah. That that's apparently like specified the the, the exact name in the uh, of the namer in the original fairy tale. Mm-hmm. Um anyway, who like then like sees Kaguya and like gives her the name of uh, of Kaguya. It's a, it's a bit longer the actual name, but um but like uh, one important bit is that like he names her after the the bamboo because he the like I think it's like shining, shining light of the supple bamboo is like the translation, um, and like of course the uh, uh, the bamboo cutter, the old the old guy is like ec- ecstatic, um, and uh, and uh, David J. Bradley points out that like it's interesting how re- much earlier in the movie when the neighborhood kids were calling her Takenoko because she reminded them of bamboo. Mm-hmm. That's not okay. She's Hime. She's not Takenoko. But now when it's this old guy who's like, this girl reminds me of Bamboo. I'm going to call her Kaguya. Now, all of a sudden, it's amazing and yeah. great and how it's supposed to be. Good point. It is imbued with more legitimacy because it comes from nobility, even if it's essentially the same same thought. And to yeah. have all to names say, and nicknames. of all the nobles, this old guy is still like somewhat all right because he's like, yeah, this kid is playing with a cat. I think that's funny. I like to get to know the real her before I name her, right? Like he get he has that moment and then he's impressed how she can switch into the more refined role immediately, basically on a dime. Yeah. And, that's and what yet he, him. his naming of her is the seal which uh, sort of formalizes her transition into becoming this othered class of you know of person and 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 ceasing to be human in yeah. the conception that she had when she was just Takenoko Unfortunately, yeah. yes, because Takenoko is basically dead and buried by now, because now we have Kaguya Hime, who's someone else. And yeah. the way yeah. in which she has been taken out of normal life is best exemplified by her coming of age ceremony, where it is supposed to be a big party for her, but everyone is invited to celebrate her coming of age. But she's behind a paper screen, supposed to just sit there and be an object for them to talk about, even though she is not interacting with them in any yeah, way. Yeah, they can't even see her. They can't even see and, her. And I, I, I want to just emphasize, you know, this coming-of-age ceremony, it's the same as in many Western patriarchal traditions, is that this is a, this is a you know, quote-unquote celebration of a maiden... It, yeah having her first menstruation and yeah, becoming that's heavily heavily implied and like yes. hot to miss. Yeah, becoming fertile. very heavily implied and so she's now of childbearing um you know a- ability physically and so that is what makes her you know she she has been placed as now she is truly a woman because she can be uh the childbearer for a potential, you know, husband. Yeah. yeah. Which, um, ew. Yeah, exactly. Not, not, not the period, the cra- but the, uh, very <laughs> the, that type of objectifying no. of, of woman. And, uh, you know, this objectification is, uh, exactly what is happening when she's placed in this tiny little, uh, you know, chamber in, during this, the three-day celebration, she's apart from everybody. She doesn't actually get to participate in the party or have any fun. Exactly. But she, all, doesn't she get can to meet hear people. the men outside objectifying her and saying, oh, she's, she's supposed to be beautiful or whatever. Well, you know, yeah, well, she's just a she's just a peasant. So, can, like... Let's hold on a second. the scenes we see at the party are incredibly, like, 
all the men are literally just lying about drinking for days on end. Uh, and when they're not, they're like doing weird, stupid dances because they're drunk and they yeah. don't care. Oh, which oh, I think is grabbing... kind of meant to parallel how the women are meant to be, you know, restricted and polite. Yeah. But the oh, men can act like, you know, yeah, they can, yeah, they can. They're, they're, they're have grabbing, freedom after they're the, grabbing uh, the serving of, ladies yeah. as well, trying to like uh, pinch them and stuff. Um, but in yeah. general, this kind of lecturous and, um, you know, uh, how do, how, what's the academic term? Dickheaded behavior yes. of all the noblemen. <laughs> and that's dickheaded is important because this is where the hats come in. So I think it, it, they actually do work as like, uh, as meant to being like phallic symbols. Because that's like a the, long tradition throughout a lot of history. Yeah. Uh, like noblemen will actually have like literal like phalluses or like big, stupid, elongated things to represent, you know, their dwindling masculinity. And so uh, all these noblemen wearing these big, stupid, tall hats to, to show how tall and big they are. Uh, it's kind of like part of the subtext of how mm. they perceive themselves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's also the... Uh, very notably, like the, the 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 scene with the um one of the five suitors who like ad- attempts to s- seduce Kaguya and is thwarted. He he drops his hat and is really panicked about that. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's I I think that's actually something to that reading. Yeah. So before yeah. we get into the really conflict driven radical scene that happens at the celebration, oh, I just want to yeah. quickly highlight a thing about her parents again like uh, as you mentioned voice there's like a discussion of class happening at the celebration where they're looking down on Kaguya's parents uh, one noteworthy thing is that Kaguya's mother actually has stopped rather quickly trying to act all courtly and has instead been tending to a small garden that they keep in the palace a space that sort of becomes a refuge for her and Kaguya to have some intimate time together, tend to the garden, you know, sing uh, the songs throughout the movie, and all of these things. So her mother they... retains some of that former life, some of that more yeah. authentic life in this small domesticated space, which is how and we it have... Remains, it remains a, a place where Kaguya can reconnect to her sort of cultural heritage to her even roots, though it's even. still very like the separation has is was final but yeah and the domestication know. of nature in that space will become a very important thing later when Kaguya yes. becomes the person mainly tending the garden but for now i think it's just important to say that not only does Kaguya really value the connection to her class to her origin out there in nature and to the what her mother and her are still doing in that little garden but also the parents maintain an element of that that is dear to them so when Kaguya overhears through the paper screen that the men at the celebration are looking down on her parents for being peasants and that really a peasant girl couldn't be so pretty as to warrant all of this you know so show us that girl show us that peasant girl that is supposedly so beautiful that she deserves all of this and you know, we know the the, the scene. This uh, results. Yeah, in. it's like the most radical fucking scene in the entire movie. He says she yeah, watching the... that scene said that's radical. <laughs> yeah, it, it is radical. It's the uh, the escape from the palace. Uh, yeah. th- there's this there's this brief uh, there's this second where like all else in the movie like like all the sounds shut up for uh, for a beat as. Kaguya, like, uh, she snaps this little little b- tiny bowl she has it holding in, in her hand, uh, and the entire style of the movie just warps as she, like, dashes out of the palace, like, smashing through the doors, and then, like, be, like begins, like, her, her clothes begin flying off. It becomes this flurry of motion with these, uh, th- this, like, this, like, really, like, ap- like the the style turning gra- more and more abstract as she like runs through the woods outside the capital and uh, becomes this blur of like charcoal sketches barely sticking together as she like clambers and dashes uh, her way back to, to towards her home. It's like she runs towards the moon is what I find really significant. These scenes, the yeah, moon that, that's, is present that's, everywhere. Yeah, she's also, dropping layers of clothes as she is approaching the moon pretty directly head on as she runs back into nature. Yeah, but like, like it's, it's such an impactful moment. Like, I, I, I don't know about you, uh, you folks, but like, when I, like, a- a- anytime I I watch this movie, it's still like it still shocks. 
me. It's, it's still like like leaves me in awe when, when that sequence yeah. comes around. It's most yeah. definitely I, the most memorable scene of the movie. It it's really stands out in every way in which it is made and in which it feels. And the way music is used is also very interesting because music seemingly fades in and out of existence during this segment, sometimes being replaced entirely by silence and her steps and running and the noises that she makes. And then music returns for a brief second to accentuate some moment of it and then fades away again. It's It's really kind of radical as Joey yeah. said she said there's there's a lot of for for such a a scene with such intense movement and emotion most filmmakers would would really rely on the music to convey <clears throat> the pathos but uh while at first there is the music when she first bursts out of the palace which is you know really symbolic of her like really just trying to exert her autonomy she wants to be free she wants to escape from this place that is so constraining where she's being treated as an object and she she bursts out she she sheds the layers of the clothes which i think it's perfect Platon. i think you said how all of the layers of the clothes are very heavy and constrain the movement of the noble woman and so she sheds all of those so that she can move more freely. And um, that sort of physicality is a way that Kaguya sort of rebels against the uh, very confining life that, you know, it, it is what is, rep you know, what she has at the palace. Yeah, like you, you feel this... Uh, this constraining of her, like uh, gradually, like yeah. uh, subtly in some ways, yeah, it, it builds tension over time, and 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 throughout this movie, it's all been like going at a like normal pace uh, in a way, like uh, like we talked about earlier, it felt like you know reality in some way, um, even with the fantastical elements, it, it's all like linear, it's all like uh, one thing at a time. So while we might be like expecting her to like do something in that situation. The like the snap of it, the and and the yeah. visceral uh, like way it's it's all communicated already like makes it feel like dreamlike and otherworldly, and just like breaks with the movie in such a like like we say radical way that you feel viscerally as well. This this. A, a radical breakaway from this like cage she's been put in. It's mm -hmm. just it's such a powerful sequence, and she uh, looks less. Uh, you know, she she looks almost demon like to me in in that oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. when she's running and she has the really fierce eyebrows and all of her features are are sort of warping because these rough passionate charcoal lines are you know, uh, from frame to frame are kind of moving. And so it, it gives her this uh, warping, uh, you know, um, look. And um, it, it kind of almost uh, for you know, it's, it, she is literally running towards the moon, right? as she leaves yeah, the palace it, it, and that it's it also kind of she's returns to this yeah. yeah she's returning to the moon which of course means ceasing to be human uh because you know she'll become a child of the moon later on again and and not have any memory but there's kind of this uh alien nature to uh kaguya in that scene and i think it's kind of her in, in choosing to flee that place, she's already sort of returning to a uh, a state of being that is uh, less human. Yeah. I, I actually see it the opposite way. See, to me, in that scene where we get the, the intense zoom in on her face, it's probably the most, like, realistically proportioned she looks in the whole movie because otherwise she has a pretty cartoonish simplified face but in this one mm. scene it's it's this intense emotional like detail 
like every part of her face is moving and the wind's blowing into it and her eyebrows are kind of uh like jagged and uh yeah. look like hair you know so it's to me it's this kind of one scene where she's at her most like uh emotional peak for the that's audience. That's true. That's true. And the the emotion there is very much grounded in her humanity yeah. like the, the... and and by contrast the ending scene where she mm-hmm. puts on the crown and cloak and goes to the moon it's like where the where i feel like maybe i'm wrong but where it looks like the lines in the movie are the most refined and properly drawn in a traditional style they're not sketchy or like lacking uh detail at all they're uh they're really refined and she's completely calm and serene in her like ascendance to the moon I, I think there are still sketches, just the movements aren't as, like, yeah. uh, you know... Uh, Passionate. Like, l- living <laughs> and imperfect. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's that's true. The imperfection of her dash away from the palace and, you know, it's very emotionally charged. And uh, so emotionally charged in her movement that Takahata does away with the music in some parts of it just to allow her movement to convey her emotion only the movement yeah, and, no and, 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 background and this, music but, but there's still like the sound effects which like That's throughout true. the movie are like really really good at grounding everything like just you you listen to the way that like just uh, bare feet running on uh these like uh, uh hollow wooden floors Th- this movie has that down pat like it's just it's absolutely <laughs> insane like some of the like how pitch perfect some of the sound design is. Yeah. Um, but 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 that's a digression. Um, yeah, indeed. Uh, so where wanna, is she running? Well, she she runs back to the uh, the the village where she grew up, the place that she misses, where she finds uh, herself like alienated once again. Sadly, indeed. Her yeah, it, her old home is now like a stranger lives there now, and her all her like childhood like friends and uh have moved elsewhere for like for better like uh um, here's an observation a, would, a really yeah. good observation she comes home and it is winter now but did you notice what season it was when she was at the palace no because winter is sort of immaterial at the palace yes. you don't experience and that's it. one thing i really want to talk about oh, okay uh, good with regards to the scene is the theme of like the changing seasons um yeah. so it's it's the thing that's like it's presence it it's present in the original text where it's for, but where it's for the most part de- like a way to describe time passing they're like oh and and summer turns to autumn turns to winter turns to spring stuff um but but it's definitely there and it's like obviously a big thing in japanese culture because it's a japan is just a country where the seasons are like so like remarkably like visible uh, in many ways um you uh you have it like in her childhood it's like a very important motif in the movie um the uh like the weather and the animals the bugs uh, and that's where we have that that song again um with like uh, th- that like f- folk song that i believe is like made for the movie but sounds pitch perfectly as like a an old folk song uh, with like oh uh, the the bugs, the birds, the beasts, and the the trees and the flowers, and they bring the seasons, and the wheel uh, the wheel turns and uh, like the cycle starts over. So, and that's once once again we get this like cycle, um, and here like this is the first time she sees winter, and what she fears is that like oh no this place is dead. And uh, and she walks around there like basically clad like a you know homeless like poor orphaned girl because like obviously she she ran through the fucking woods. Oh yeah, um, and that's that's really yeah, driven yeah. home because she when she approaches her childhood home and and this she sees a little stranger's baby, and then the stranger test, comes test. out and wordlessly you know, according to Buddhist custom, like offers you know, this beggar, uh, some, some food in a small bowl, even though yeah, yeah. she's just a, you know, sustenance, uh, you know, uh, peasant, uh, herself, but, uh, she looks like a poor person and as such is, is treated as one, which like 
the the way in which like your your class like colors your experience that's that's a whole other theme we'll get to um but at any rate she she wanders around um and uh and it's winter and it's the first time she's ever seen winter mm-hmm. and uh and she meets this uh this charcoal uh maker um who to to whom she she asks like do you know what happened to everyone and he's like oh well they uh, they all to the rapture <laughs> no they uh they all went to uh to look for like a different like uh more fertile forest to be in because this place was like for over forested and now it's uh underforested and we give it time to grow they'll be back in 10 years or so and she's like 10 years <laughs> like she, that that that's an eternity you know um and a- anyway like yeah she's alienated once again from this childhood home she doesn't ha- really have a thing to go back to she doesn't belong there anymore it is made yeah, exactly. visually clear through now the different clothing she's wearing fancy clothing but also she has left it behind and everyone's moved on because that's what they do and i yeah. thought the it's reasoning the... the charcoal maker gave was really important here too because this is yes. where the ecological themes come back again uh, as usual with takahara and Miyazaki also um, the idea is that they move on every 10 years or so or when they've exhausted the forest in a way so that so it can regrow in a healthy way until yeah. they can return to it back when it has fully recovered and they can make use of it again. There's a very sustainable and, you know, yeah. repeatable a, a, a bit of like harmony. a n- native uh, c- culture thing like... like... Uh, at, at the very least in, in the West, especially America, you associate that sort of treatment of nature with like native traditions of uh, people who, who's like who've lived on the land for generations. This like but mutual careful. respect. As Takahara would inform you, there's a very modern tradition of ecological farming where you you know just help nature do its thing, and that's not you know a nature. Alone yes, thing correct. it is human made, as we know from only yesterday. Watch that podcast, everybody yeah, is listening a, right now. One of the best uh, documentaries on uh, ecological farming. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes, it's our cultivation. podcast is yes. the best documentary on <laughs> ecological no, farming. No. no, I mean, I mean that section of only yesterday. It's, yes, true. There is artifice yeah. to it. There's very much this, you know, human hand at play, but it's done conscientiously. It's done responsibly and with yes. with respect to nature. It doesn't. Exactly. Break it's not just the pure nature. exploitation of yeah. nature, but it's a helping hand to bring out nature's own life force. Right, yes. And and this is also when he explains basically the concept of winter to her. She's like, is everything dead here? And he's like, what? No. And sh- shows her this this uh, branch where uh, the, the like the little birds are, are like working on it, you know? After and every the- winter, there comes a spring. And that's yeah, who, who really thought? important for yes. uh, to hear yes. for Kaguya. Exactly, because like it, it gets back to this uh, the cyclical nature of life, which like again we get back to some of the like old tried and true themes in a, in like uh, especially Japanese culture, um, and this is like the first time she's like really uh, learns about this this cycle, um, because. Like when you haven't ever experienced two springs, you might like look at a winter landscape and be like, "Shit, everything's dead." Oh my god! But it's god. not the fuck. And this, this is yes, and uh, and and at this point, uh, we all another really important thing thing happens where she um, she goes out to to the middle of a like snowy field, falls over, basically like symbolically like dying in the in the in the cold and she looks out of the landscape and she declares i've seen this somewhere before this white like pale cold and landscape then the and then the, the little up. spirits the little moon spirits around her and she wakes up back where um back at the the banquet yeah um, as if she had never left although the little plate is still broken what yes. i think it's really interesting here is of course you make the connection to the moon because the moon is so cold and dead and there's a sense of not belonging and all of these things because it is associated with this cold winter landscape where she feels like she has no place where she belongs right but mm-hmm. also the theme that kind of stays with us is spring is coming because this is exactly what transitions us into what i call the next act 
because the next scene we see is Kaguya accepting that she has to put on the makeup, get rid of her eyebrows, and blacken her teeth. A at least yeah. accept in so far as that she allows it to happen mm -hmm. now. Yeah, because there's, there's part, I think part of it is that the vision shows that there's nowhere to return to. And, uh, but yeah, I, I can definitely see your interpretation that like she realizes that like, okay, it may might feel like this is the end or something, but uh, but spring comes around again. It but, will uh, endure the hard times in order to get back to that joy that you've lost, to that peace, innocence, or whatever. The spring is coming, you know. Yes, that, that however, is... one one thing that I find really interesting that like uh, re repeats through the movie is like uh, we've discussed earlier how isolated from nature you are when you are noble like that. Um, and, and this is like an ongoing thing where, um, like her handmaid, like brings her a cherry blossom branch from outside because she can't go out and actually see it. There's a lot of like nature imagery within the, uh, the walls of the palace, like on the, um, on the sliding doors, on the kim kimonos. Um, but, but the only like real piece of nature is this like tiny garden they have, which they make into a like simulacrum of their home but which is like and always will be like a, only like a simulation and not the real thing um, um just to be clear when exactly is this scene located where they do this i think this is now act three right like like they, yeah she that, like, starts that comes as, later i'm just yeah trying to like expand on the theme as we uh, yeah, yeah we're discussing I, I it in, sp in specific um one uh and w one thing that i find really uh important about this is there's this association with winter and death and the moon with winter and the moon with death and basically like Takahata has like openly declared that like he sees this quote-unquote return to the moon as her like essentially dying yeah um but one like hopeful thing within this whole movie and within the tragedy is like the way that the, this cyclical nature of life and death uh, is like repeated over and over, and there's um, and there's this implication that she went, she went, or was sent to Earth because of some ethereal longing for living, for life, and she returns to the moon, having lived like enough. To possibly one day long for it again, or someone else from the moon will long for it again. So I th I think that's a really uh, like the most like hopeful reading of the ending. But uh, we will get into that deeper once yeah. we get there. Yeah, once we get. But to the for end. now, I really like yeah. thinking about the simulacrum because you know it is kind of how relationship uh, man's humanity's relationship to nature has shifted as well. We've shifted from being products of nature, living in nature, growing up in nature, at least in this pastoral kind of mythologization of human past, uh, and moved into domestication of nature. And this is such an apt idea that she would capture her lost home, her lost innocence, in rebuilding that space in that small garden in the palace. Like, it is all made by herself, made by hand in a small, extremely domesticated piece of nature. But it instills her with hope that this spring, that spring of her lifetime, so to speak, is gonna return to her as well. And that carries her sort of into this act in which she tries a bit more to um, endure and go with whatever is expected of her, at least to some extent. Uh... Uh, about that little garden, I will say that that might come up again later when we talk about the, the Buddhist themes, but I think it's interesting that, it's like you say, yeah, it's like a domesticated piece of nature where, like, they don't really have to worry about the winter or the crops or anything because they can kind of afford it within their, like, within inside the safe walls of their massive palace. Yeah. Um, well, we... Yeah, uh, so as you said, Nyad, she wakes from this dream or was it a dream um and after that she seems to resign herself but like m might be like a just a like uh like enduring uh there is a, is a, there is a degree to which i think she is genuinely now trying to yeah. see th what this life 
that is now cast upon her has to offer. Yeah, so there's also the element yeah. of trying to make her father happy because she loves him, which is, you know... Exactly. That, yeah, she recognizes important. her father wants happiness for her, and she's I, I sort of willing to give it a try. Yeah, yeah. Might, might it's kind of an some... epiphany moment, though, because like we said... Um, it's not clear if it's like a dream or if it's real. There's like, you know, a vague magical element to it. But like she now knows that there is no returning to the home that she once knew because they're like that doesn't exist anymore. The people yeah. are gone. The house is gone. It's 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 all completely vanished. There was like at least a thin hope that she could just return from the palace one day that her father would give up this fantasy. But now she yeah, yeah. I think I feel like it really is she's resigned. That's the, the times kind of and the tone seasons. of the scene of her having her eyebrows plucked and yeah. putting on the stupid yeah. she, black paint. She she has this vision and she sees that the times and the seasons have changed and there's there's no going back in time. She can't relive her childhood. And it's in 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 it has a um you know broader cultural theme here which is that similar to how Kaguya cannot return to her you know, idyllic childhood, you know, humanity cannot return to this golden, you know, pastoral age that things have changed too much already. There's no going back to that. But there is this idea that, you know, if, if, if there can be some responsibilities, a conscientiousness, you can sort of keep in mind that that was where you came from and build towards like, you know, a, a new spring. Yeah. Right. But, but let's um, talk about how she's gonna now have to, you know, endure mm -hmm. uh, what is ahead of her in order to build to that new spring. Well, it yes. appears that the, the celebration and the mystique around Kaguya, who nobody has seen, people have been talking and she's become quite famous because there's been rumors about her beauty and the guy who named her basically went around telling a couple of noble people, hey, she's really pretty. And they yeah. were all like, you know, I don't care about a peasant girl and so on, but they got curious, you know. Mm. So these five people, all of them like high ranking officials, basically each of them symbolic of some kind of government or nobility position. Yeah. Princes all and ministers. Come to her as suitors. And, you know, I find it interesting that, like, they appear all, like, poised and performatively noble. Like, oh, that peasant girl won't get her. And then the guy says, but she's really pretty. And they're all like, oh. And then yeah. when they're actually there, they, like, fall over each other and rush to the paper screen behind which Kaguya is sitting. Like, all, like, eager. Like, like let me have her. Let me let me see her. I want her. Yeah, like, but before that, they're like racing, animals. To, the, they're racing yeah. to the palace on horseback exactly. and in carriages and just, like... Almost, like almost like murdering a bunch of innocent people on the street. Yeah, and they're <laughs> yeah. in competition so they're like, they're with just... each other already. Yeah, the yeah. poise of nobility breaks apart when the sort of animalistic desire for that beautiful thing they want to possess overcomes them. Yeah, and, you the know, the makes worst the worst part so. of it uh, for me was uh, the way the old man who names her describes her. Where I believe the the line goes, "My body began to tremble." Yeah, and it was as if an old dried spring was now. Oh. Uh, you know, new life in it. Ew. It's like this very disgusting Erection. image when you consider all these guys probably in their 50s lecturing over what is like ostensibly like a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. Th <laughs> this know, is like... another thing that like uh, yet another element of the original fairy tale that uh, that Tagahata like takes and it's like, okay, what sorts of, you know, biases and presumptions were in like the, the type of person that, that wrote this? Uh, and how and when when you see it from Kaguya's perspective, if it really is like, like she's barely come of age, and there's all these like horn dog, like thirty to fifty year olds, you know. Oh yeah. Like it's just really fetishist falling over each other. It's yeah. it's not just horniness. I think that's again uh, specifically in the way he describes it, like really cuts to the heart of that kind of um, fetishization. Yeah. I don't know what, to, what to say? Yeah, fetishization, but also this kind of the general masculine possessiveness that the right. story invokes yeah yes, if you it says, it's like a dry spring come yeah. to life so yeah like if you'd kind of almost vampiristically suck youth and obtain it and possess it and like get, a bit, get of it as much as possible 
and it will almost make you young again. It will restore that failed masculinity. It is. Because remember, yeah, they didn't even have to have. see her to want her, right? Yeah, like, yeah, they just right. had to they hear the even... rumors that she's supposedly so yeah. beautiful to think about how they might look like if they had a beautiful wife. Right. Yeah. They, they, she is the prize, and the one who gets the prize will be recognized as the as the most worthy and thus, you know, better than the others. And it's very much in this masculine power fantasy and this competition that starts immediately. They haven't even heard her voice yet. And they're <laughs> clamoring over each other to be the one to get her. Uh, yeah, to seize speaking, her. Of, uh, speaking of prices, uh, this is where like one of the like key differences between the original yeah. text and the uh and, and the movie comes around is when when they've all like uh, arrived at the palace and uh and sits like they're like uh, in a row and, and are like trying to like uh woo her to their side um in the original text uh basically they were all just like the like most eligible suitors and she uh kaguya hime uh in the original like not exactly the main character it's not a point of view character and just like this mysterious uh you know born from the heavens creature she immediately like points to each of them and and gives them these missions which like quests it, it, it's there's a very fairy tale element of it you know and yeah. this, like again she, she's a um a, a, a what you might call it a uh a magic pixie moon girl um <laughs> And well, that's that's one of the classist things that I think is also yeah. very of note. We didn't touch it there, but the, in the last scene, they're like, oh, she's a peasant girl. She's like not worthy of our noting. But then the old man says, no, no, she was born from a bamboo stalk. She's like this ethereal god child, you know. And then suddenly they're like, oh, well, that's acceptable for nobility. Yeah, that, that, that that's a good yeah. point. Also, yeah. Um, well, what I was getting to is that in this version, uh, instead, what happens is each of them like compares her to this like rare unobtainable treasure treasure yeah um this uh, the the like uh, uh, this my- mythical like golden branch of this super rare tree or this like rare animals magic fur mm-hmm. um the bo- the, the stone, stone bowl of the buddha, of the buddha yeah. which is like but basically like the, the, Almost like the, the closest Western equivalent would be like the Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. F- um, like mythologically. A and, jewel from the uh, neck of a dragon. Yes. The, <laughs> the neck of a dragon, the king, the king of the sea. Uh, and then a simple and one. Last, but... Yeah. And the last one is a simple one. The cowrie shell of a, of, of a, of a, from a swallow's nest, which is like apparently uh, this like myth that uh, sw- swallows as they make their nest as... Uh, Every now and then they, they like have like this like really fine rare uh, shell that they add uh, along with their eggs, um, which I'm, I'm pretty sure like that's a myth. And, and it's kind of like an image of like something like fleeting and you won't ever find it kind of like it's like, like a like a four leaf clover, only like more insane. Yeah, so all these guys compare her to treasures that are hard to obtain and think about. No, like, not I love hard to obtain. They are impossible, impossible to obtain. To yes, obtain. Yeah, yeah. yes, impossible. Thanks. Unobtainium. Um, <laughs> the point being that Kaguya then goes and says, well, I can't really imagine your love to me unless you show me these treasures. So bring them to me and I will marry him who can do this. And this is one of the changes <laughs> because Takahara gives her the chance to basically take what they say, basically objectify, and send them into these impossible tasks. Uh, the original Kaguya also sends them on impossible tasks. But, but she's the one who Kaguya comes up with those, the, with those yeah. objects, whereas in this telling, the those objects are what the, the nobles themselves are comparing her to in a, in a way just to very simply, very cheaply, you know, uh, yeah. gain her favor because they imagine that as a woman she is uh you know basically in their imagination she is an object and the most you know uh effulgent image of uh you know treasure to compare her to will 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 make her happy 
and will convince her to be be theirs. But Indeed. she doesn't want what? to be long. She doesn't want to belong to anybody. She doesn't want to be anybody's treasure to be kept. Exactly. And this is the moment Takahata again imbues Kaguya with a lot of agency that she didn't have in that same way in the original. Here the agency consists of, I have been objectified by these men. I will now assert the fact that I cannot be objectified by them, giving them these impossible tasks related directly to their objectification of me. It's Which the moment I, I of rebellion think, that she is granted. I, I actually think that even in the original tale, that's also part of what she was doing. This, uh, like, it, it was in part, like, teaching these suitors, like, a, a, a lesson in trying to obtain the unobtainable. Well, I'm not um, so sure, because I think... It's not made clear why she does it in the original yes, story, and that's Takahata's problem with the original story. Exactly. The, the yeah, Kagehime no does these things, she asks this impossible task, and he's kind of sitting down thinking, well, why would you do that? Like, is this just a very elaborate way of telling them to fuck off? Maybe, <laughs> you know, like... He wants to yeah. Kind of, yeah, imbue this story with a lot more uh, reasons why things are happening. And again, we yeah, have to that, think about another... the we have to think about the implicit bias of the society from which this came from. This was written for the court. It was, yeah, you know. So the it 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 puts the court in a favorable light. And the reason at the end of the story that Kaguya returns to heaven and is goes to this place of detachment is because she rejects the nobles she should have after rejecting the nobles she should have at least accepted the emperor's offer to be his wife which is exactly what is you know in the original tale when she basically <clears throat> you know is saying like oh oops i guess i messed up i should have been your wife after <laughs> all here's an immortality yeah. potion and yeah, exactly. that's literally the end and then he spites her because she did not behave as a woman should, which is to belong to a man. And as exactly this right. treasure, as this object, what is the, what what do objects desire? Well, the, the only thing that an object can desire is to be possessed by the most worthy person, who, in, in this case, a man, right? And so, uh, you You're know, exactly her, right. sin, her sin, which made her be exiled to the moon again at the end is that she did not accept her position as her rightful position according to the original you know um telling as belong as the as the you know belonging to a man so uh, yeah that's think a, about that's this in reading. the original um, uh, in the original kaguya is sort of punished because think about what happens <clears throat> in the next act right like here, um, uh, we have her immediately go, okay, you bring me these treasures, then I'll marry you, right? In the original. So they didn't say it, she said it, to get rid of them. But then someone dies, and she feels really bad about it, because even the original, one of them dies doing this. And the implicit notion is here, look at these noble uh, court people, and these noble, powerful people who did so much to try and get her attention. Yeah, they're going but, on these you know, honorable quests. Exactly. And this is completely inverted by Takahata. These aren't honorable quests. They compared her to an object and then she turns it against them. There's no sense of the same honorable thing that these brave men well, are all uh, trying to, you know, get, uh, uh, fulfill her wishes because it is react a reaction of her against being objectified in this one. I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit uh, on a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, I think that there's a reading of the of the original text where it, rather than like her being punished for not wanting to belong to any of these noblemen, um, I, my, my, my read will, would be that like she like knows deep down that she will leave like from much earlier in the story. I mean, that's why um, she rejects she the later. emperor, yeah, and because yes, she does not belong yes. in this world, right. Exactly. And the other thing is that she, I, th I think it's even explicitly said by her that like she wants to belong to her dad. She wants to be with him as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And that so there's still the fealty to the, to the male figure. Um, that's true. That's a good point. to a husband. And I think another part that, that does... I think contribute to your reading is is that in the folk tale or in the original uh, story rather, she 
is already self-identifying as a moon child at that point. Whereas in this part of the film telling in Takahata's version, she's she doesn't yet consciously know that she is a moon child. And instead, she feels just like a normal woman. But she she doesn't want to be put in this place of, of belonging to any man. So right. I think that because she... Is she doesn't have the detachment from the world that the Kaguya in the folktale does. Yeah. And uh, one other thing I wanted to push back on was Nia talking about these honorable quests. Well, let, let's. Some let's of them get aren't very honorable. <laughs> yeah, because, like, for the most part, th- this part is actually, with one really big exception, uh, it's pretty true to, to the original tale. So, first of all, the, uh, the, the man who goes to find the, uh, the golden branch. Yeah. That's, um, uh, Kuramochi. Yeah. Yes. Um, so one difference uh, is like point of view, because the fairy tale goes into detail about each of them, the, how they scheme or how they attempt to succeed. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas here, it's all from Kaguya's perspective, obviously, like we've yeah. talked about. Um, but but yeah, it, it is like true to the original text. Uh, first guy, the uh, uh, Golden Branch, he tries to cheat. He uh, he pretends to uh, be like out on a travel. Uh, then he he's spins this whole yarn uh, to Kaguya and reveals this golden branch, which he actually had a bunch of, um, uh, you know, uh, metallurgists and, uh, and and gemstone, uh, you know, goldsmiths and all that do for him and hasn't paid them properly. Yeah, that's, that's More so, classism, uh, doesn't yeah. even try to pay them. Why that's yeah. the difference between him and the second, right? The second suitor who right. has the fire rat cloak is yes, he actually also pays for manufactures it. it. But yeah, it's... He pays for it at least. <laughs> I think in the original tale, like he has a guy, he knows a guy in China who knows a guy, and like he sends a lot, a lot, a lot of money, spends a lot of money on getting this thing that he believes to be authentic. Um, and just like in the original tale, Kaguya tells him, "Well, uh, burn it because this is like from the fire mink or the fire rat." Is is the fire rat is the literal translation? Um, I, I read a translation that called it a fire mink because sure. that. Has more of a some variety of Pokemon fur. at least. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> a, 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 a Vulpix. <laughs> uh, mm. um, anyway, uh, so she's like, "Okay, let's burn it," and uh, and in in the original text, there's once again we have this Kaguya that's like ethereal, mysterious, and kind of already knows all everything. Um, like it's implied that she recognizes it as a fake immediately. Um, in this version, you see her shaking, like she's hoping, hoping that this is really is a fake and she doesn't have to go back on her word. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it burns and it, it burns up. And this rich guy's like, fuck my whole fortune, <laughs> um, which he seems, I, I like the part where it's, he seems more distressed about losing the money than losing a chance with Kaguya, which yeah, dodge the bully on that, on that one, uh, princess. Um, the third one, um, I believe is, is, is the Buddha bowl. And that's where the biggest well, difference. The, between, the, the third the... one is technically, uh, sort of like not from Kaguya's perspective. It's, it's, she was told a story about, uh, Otomo who goes in search of the, uh, the jewel from the neck of the dragon. Oh, and he... yeah, the dragon, he, he, he gave up his search after like, Basically, angering a sea a, a sea god well, and being I, tossed around at sea, I think, and, and I think for that's metaphorical. I mean, obviously, there is like some magical elements to the story, but it, what I don't think it's necessarily important that he was like thwarted by a god. It's more that yes, it was correct. too. It, it was the quest was not as um, uh, fulfilling as he hoped, and he he <laughs> he was terrified for his life uh, on these raging seas, and and he gave up. So. Uh, yeah, but, like, but let's let's think, talk about how he original... gives up just briefly because he you have like <laughs> this big pompous like samurai dude like yeah I'm gonna fight the skies and his his like uh, workers are basically like you fucking idiot you're gonna be hit by lightning drop that fucking sword and then they tie him to the boat so he doesn't fall off like this is just yeah. beautiful like this guy yeah. who has no fucking idea what he's doing being held yeah, back in, by in his the, uh, more competent people but like, yeah. in the original fairy tale like it, it's. Very, it's it's like clear that th- that's an actual dragon. He actually angers, and, and the the seamen right, are like, course. I've never seen such a hard storm. You must have angered the 
uh, the god, please pray for forgiveness. And he does so, and he gives up the quest. Again, yeah. that's... In this case, yeah, though, it's the, a normal ass you know. storm, and he's scared to death. Yeah, it's a normal like, storm. Yeah, no, I like it's gonna pass. Dreaming. It's gonna be fine, buddy. The, 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 the seaman who's with him, who ties him to the post, is like, it's just a storm. You won't drown. It, it, you know, it'll pass. So he's not alarmed. He he recognizes, yeah, this is a bad storm. We have to, you know, tie ourselves down or or we can get tossed overboard. But it's not going to be, you know, this is not some uh, divine punishment, right? Yeah, but once again, I like that there's, in the original, there's this like kind of theme about like uh, the hubris of trying to obtain the unobtainable. Yeah. But in this version, it really is just like, he just he gives up because he doesn't like want her as badly as his fine words would would declare. He's like he, he's he's he's, yeah. he's, a, he's too much of a coward to actually like go through something like that. Yeah. Um. Which which is like a yeah it's a pr- pretty good change I think a pretty interesting change. Um. But like this the biggest change of all of them is the guy who goes for uh Buddha's uh stone, stone bowl. bowl. Yeah. Where in the original, he actually like, like goes all the way to India, finds something he believes could be, maybe, if fingers crossed that she, she won't see through it, um, if, if, it, if it isn't. And he presents it to her and she's like, that's not it. Buddha's bowl would like be like shining with like unbelievable light. This is just a stone bowl. Like, get out of here. And that's about it. Mm-hmm. Um which once again we have a Kaguya who is like supernatural in like in every sense of the word. She that has she, this knowledge of yes, mystical things. Yes, she has things. this heavenly knowledge. Yeah, heavenly knowledge. And yeah. and she like sees through him immediately. Um, this version is completely different. Uh, he attempts to like kind of he he seems to like believe that what he's been sent on is like a, a, a wild goose chase it's a game that he's that he he's gonna yep. he's gonna subvert it by being like okay so the test here isn't like whether i can actually get this thing the test is can i like speak to what she really wants which is not treasure and uh and he he's pretty smart about it actually like uh, presents this beautiful like little flower from the roadside which is his gift to her and try, it explains this whole story about how like that that's what she reminds him of and and he he loves those like little unassuming flowers on the road and they and they could be happy together and they should like run like leave the run capital, away together live yeah. a different life and then he fucks it all up well here's what happens little, like yeah you know she, being a little she perv. this I, I, this scene is really important to me because yeah. it also contrasts very much with how the emperor treats her later, and I'll get into that when we get to him. But this this guy, his name is Ishizukuri, and he, I I I don't even want to call him smart because it's giving him too much credit. He's very wily uh, because yes, cunning in his, yeah. and cunning in his womanizing strategy. He he speaks to her in a way that gives her a she, she he he's baiting her with this promise that they will escape and she will escape this life which has caged her and she will be able to live a life that is free i mean her eyes are widening when she's listening to him from behind the screen and she begins to to hope that this is true and just as he's about to you know finish his you know uh ro- you know romantic speech she is ushered away into the next room by her mother, and the person that replaces her is Ishizukuri's wife, who he threw out in order to, you know, seduce Kaguya to have the, you know, and so it's it's shown that his words with and oh and and he and she the, his his wife uh, knows the poem that he's reciting. So it shows how cheaply his words are because he's just willing to regurgitate. It's not personal. It's not for Kaguya. It's just as... Right, yes. It's... It's it's it's, uh, it's his playbook. Exactly. It's his playbook. Uh, well said. Uh, he's so slimy. He's so disgusting. And, and the thing that really rubs me the wrong way about him is he... He lives in this society where, you know, this patriarchal society and as a noble man, like, he 
what he desires, he will try to get. And, you know, he sees this woman as someone to puff himself up and to, you know, toy with and to get, you know, the pleasures of the flesh. And that's all she is to him, just an object to use and then throw out when he gets bored and go find the next pretty young thing. But the way that he tries to get her is really insidious because he makes an appeal to her desires, which means he recognizes in her some autonomy, some individuality, but he, yeah, but he manipulates it and exploits her. it and he uses it against her. It's it's as if, you know, it's it's and he's only able to make this promise of freeing her because she has been caged by the society and put into this position. Because it yeah. shouldn't even be his ability to make this offer. She should, as you know, as someone who came to the world to be to live freely and to experience emotion and her desires and the fullness of life, that kind of freedom should just be her birthright. You know, that's what she came here for. That's what she truly longs for. That's what she should have had all this time. And because it has been taken away from her, you know, and she is captive in this society, now a man of power can come along and dangle it on a string to get something out of her. Yeah. There's this, there's this great line in the scene where I think one of the, uh, the, uh, I, th- I think it might be like the wife who threw her out that that uh, that asked like, how many of these uh, roadside flowers have you like picked throughout your like your life? And it's like, damn, like it's pretty much accusing him of being like doing this like habitually, just yeah. like going around promising the world to, to women just to like quote unquote conquer them. Yep. Yeah, like it's and, and like what what really stings about it is like the rest of the suitors. It it seems impersonal to to Kaga. She just doesn't yeah. want to belong to them. They like uh, scheme their way, and uh, and the the schemes are like uh, discovered. And it's like, well, glad that's over with. But with with this guy, like you see it in Kaguya's eyes, and like really shout out to the animators. Like yeah. just it's so like clear that she starts to realize like, holy shit, this might actually be a guy I could be happy with. It might actually be a guy who can like give me what I actually want. Maybe, maybe this is actually a good. And then like there's he's then revealed it all to comes be just down. Yeah. you know um, you know a, a womanizer, and yes. who who only desires to pick her and to pluck her and then throw her away when her colors fade. And she's, I mean, she is absolutely. Uh, traumatized by this. I mean, she weeps in her mother's lap. I think. I think that's yeah, like, like the a, first burst of like emotion that she's shown in in a long time. But like, she really is. Uh, yeah, feels. Really, yeah, this is this is like the first part in her transition to the the next act in her change. But before we get there, there's one more suitor. Yeah, the last suitor who uh, searches for the the cowrie shell of, of the swallows, and he and fucking dies. <laughs> he fucking died. <laughs> he yeah. did. And yeah, that's I was actually, just going to say, I mean, um, all the five suitors they all run the gambit of all the pickup artist techniques from you know <laughs> trickery, bribery, lying, and then dying. You know, like all the all the ways uh, men try to cheaply get women. Oh. Yeah, man. Uh, don't don't you hate it when a when uh when a guy wants a girl so bad he dies. <laughs> so that's so the reason I was. This is the reason I was thinking of the noble quests earlier because this right. guy isn't even a bad guy. I mean, he's he's yeah, trying he, to get the, the least... shell and he dies. He's yeah, not yeah, even like, trying yeah. to cheat. He's the he's the most sympathetic, and I, I think even in in the original tale because like he he uh not only does he get like the most like down to earth thing it's not like a legendary treasure it's something that might be out there in nature but just very rare yeah. and there's some uh, and and even in the this movie like the 
like his like comparing her to uh, to something from nature is closer to what she's actually like. Mm-hmm. Um, so he he's a bit more sympathetic, um, and like but he's like also the true youngest. to the original. Oh yeah, that, that's another thing. Um, but like true to the original, like uh, he following the advice of uh, of his retainers, he like sets up this like whole like uh, elaborate system of making sure as many uh swallows uh nest themselves in this like scaffolding and uh he uh he like gets like uh a, a harness to, to to be like pulled up to uh, to like grab at them whenever they uh, you know uh, lay their eggs uh, and yeah uh he f- <laughs> the, the device just like fails he, he grabs something and and he falls down and dies and the original tale it is like even more tragic because he's He's like, uh, I think I've got it. I found it. And then he like dies right there and turns out it was nothing. It was just a neck shell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this damn. is really a commentary on transhumanism and the ma- nature of man and technology, you know? Yeah, uh, really. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, there uh, is the interesting... I, I think there's actually some symbology mm-hmm. in the his fate. Yes. Um, especially like with the themes of the, the that the movie deals with, which is like... He dies searching for some, like, mythical treasure to obtain. And, like, he dies with a baby chick in his hand. Like, yeah. maybe well, maybe he, the beauty was there, you know. As, as such a young, as such a young uh, man, it, you know, he, he's trying to live according to the uh, values of his society. And, I mean they're not good because they objectify, you know, uh, you know, women and in this case, Kaguya. And he, in his earnestness in seeking after uh, the promises of this, uh, you know, the, this patriarchal fantasy, right? He, he doesn't realize that he's on a fool's errand and, and, you know, because he's too over eager, he, uh, isn't careful. And then he dies a premature death. And in the process, there is a premature birth that happens in that he grabs the egg and it, it's cracked. And now, you know, this, this chick hatches and has no, you know, Nobody to take care of it, right? Uh, that's, um, I, I think a, a, an interesting choice that's made here is Kaguya's reaction to it. Mm. She's genuinely distressed at, at, at this news, whereas in, in the original fairy tale, again, she's ethereal, unknowable, and so like it's kind of implied that like she knows what the ends of their quests are gonna be, yeah. Um, and and so like it's not important her reaction to it. The importance is like the uh, the pattern of it. The, the, you know, it's a fairy tale in that way. Uh, but but like her reaction when she learns that like oh uh, this last guy well he dead yeah and she, when she, she, she goes like and, and she and goes th- absolutely that ape shit. The, yeah, she goes ape shit. She she destroys <laughs> the uh, the the model village uh, in the garden. And just and like goes remember, into despair, and that's when like the that moon depression thing begins. The, this model of her childhood home is sort of a capped sort of simulacrum of innocence that she once experienced as a child that she longs for. But now that she has been, well, directly in a way, the cause of someone else's death, she, I think, She's feels that this innocence is lost is lost this feeling of you know just enjoying life with all its fruits and riches and whatnot this is the first death that she experiences at all the sense that something with some finality is lost this guy who is on her errand you know getting himself in trouble and dying this it makes her realize all of this constructing of um, this this fake simulacrum yeah. garden is just an illusion. She's just been keeping her busy and has been satisfied with this instead of living fully and actually. Right. And I think it is also in this moment sort of that she realizes, you know, that she's squandering her time on this earth. She's saying, "What have I been doing here?" Yeah, she. Well, I think I think she's 
basically just been, you know, playing a game um, and not one that is done impassionately with, you know, heavenly knowledge to back her up, but just one of like, you know, hey, I, I don't want to be possessed. So I'm kind of going to twist these men's words against them. But she doesn't think that any actual harm will come of it. She just imagines that they will be shooed away and, you know, at worst, they will come back to bother her. But then this guy actually dies because of it. And she yeah. realizes that in participating in this game of, uh, you know, even if it's done with the, you know, her internal knowledge that she refuses to be possessed by entertaining the idea for these men, it, it sends them on these fool's errands and, you know, she's participating in this system. And also, I think it's interesting that um, he actually does obtain the thing. No, I mean, well, maybe it's, I, it's not made entirely clear, but he in the scene where he dies, um, he does say, I've got it. He's like reaching into the nest. He's got something in his hands. He says, I've got it. Like, pull me out, boys. Right, but, but I it, thought the again, cowrie again, shell doesn't actually have a heard. chick in it, though. The cowrie shell is like this treasure like of a, of a shell that is just the shell. Like, there's no... Yeah, embryo that, in it, it. it. Again, like the 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 movie, for for good reason, presumes that the audience has like like knows the tale, and in in the original tale, like he does declare, "I have it," falls down, and uh, he he like dies there, and it turns out that all he was holding was an eggshell. Right. All oh, right. Well, even so, more tragic, he died believing he'd won. Yes. Only to yeah. be uh to have it torn away, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh. I, I think, like, in the original, like, a again, it gets back to this, like, the foolishness of attempting the impossible, um, wh which, like, uh, but, but again, the original and wasting also, like, his objectifies... life, you know, yeah, Kavya yeah, yeah. similarly now is like, I've been wasting my life participating in yeah. this, in this fantasy of this, she you know, says, noble I'm a life fake too. Yeah. Right. Like the fake life that she has been living following these traditions yeah. rituals mores rules whatever these wrong desires in a way yes she destroys and the garden because in a way this garden changed her to this place because it is by restaging her childhood innocence with that little garden that she is able to bear with it all even though she should have she's long hoping for the spring where she out. can return to that place and that's the that's the maintenance of that hope yes yeah and now I... the spring is never gonna come she realizes yeah, that, that and one of the like big themes of the movie that I think is like, w like would be part of my central thesis on on the movie is uh, this idea of what we do about like beauty, what is beauty, and how do we, the, and the very like human des like desire to, to like try and encapsulate and objectify and materialize like the beautiful, and this is something that's like thematically in the original text and which Takahata really like works with in really interesting ways especially with contrasting it with the natural beauty um of of the like beginning of the film speaking of natural um, beauty every, and a scene that we yeah. completely forgot about that's in this act in between yes. the time that she sends away the five noble suitors on these errands which she believes will get rid of them for good at that time right yeah. In between that and when they return, she she has this sort of burden that's lifted from her when she final when she at first like sends them away and she's like let's go, you know, she she feels like oh, everybody is like everybody started giving up. People stopped lining up outside of the palace to try to sneak a peek at her because she already rejected these five nobles and they all are like, "Oh, she sent them on fool's errands." Like obviously, like she's just, you know, there's nothing for it. Like she's unobtainable. And because, you know, they can't, they can no longer, the men in the society can no longer feasibly imagine themselves uh, coming to possess her, even no matter how far-fetched it is. But now she's quashed all of those fantasies, right? And now she has a bit of freedom and she says, let's go see the, uh, the Sakura Blossoms. 
and which is actually the spring. Like she she feels like it's the new spring time of her life. She's finally gotten rid of all of these suitors. And she goes and she takes with her May and she takes with her her mother and goes to see the cherry blossom. And there's this beautiful scene where she's just dancing joyfully and enjoying the nature. She really thinks that maybe this is the new spring. And then she trips over a toddler or a small child and, you know, knocks him over and she goes there and tries to scoop him up and, and, and make sure that he's okay. And, you know, she sees that he's okay. And the mother of this child who is, you know, clearly a peasant comes and bows low and, 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 and apologizes to her. And in that moment, there's also this class consciousness that is the opposite of when she went back to the village, you know, and she was in rags and tatters and the, the woman. And she was treated like a beggar. She's And in both cases, no matter which side of the class spectrum she's on, she finds herself othered. And she, you know, is feels in that moment completely alienated again and realizes, yeah, there is no going back to being one of those peasants like I was in my childhood. I, I, I can't be that because the people already do not see me as that. They don't accept me as as one of them. Yeah. You 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 see where the like the light goes out of her eyes a bit. Yeah, and then she puts um, on the you know yeah. the brimmed hat and with the veil. And the veil. That that's yeah. another thing that go, goes on through the movie. This way that like veils and barriers like separate her like as a, a signifier of class. Um. What one quick side note. Uh, I still remember clearly like the first time I watched this movie. Um. This that this exact scene, uh, there's this cut to the cherry blossom tree just standing there on top of the hill, mm-hmm. and just that exact shot was just like had such like a breathtaking effect on me. Mm-hmm. I I'd like I really think it it was that you know uh, elusive mononoaware thing that that beauty of just like this like yeah. brief moment. It, it really touched me and it's still still like uh st- still touches me when i rewatch it it's uh it's one of my like favorite little pieces of uh of the of ghibli movies i think yeah but there's so there's still like so much tragedy in it yeah and 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 the, and the score going there like that again like keeps like even in these moments of joy there's this sense that it's fleeting and we're building uh, yeah. up to absolute tragedy now right. because yes, we as are. Kaguya we are destroys as Kaguya destroys her miniature garden and with this the innocence and sort of fakeness of it all, um, she transforms again in a way. She transforms into someone who is now, well, really not finding much joy in life anymore at all. She right. is, she also stops um, putting on airs. Like she she kind of at from she that quietly point, sits places and plays Koto. Basically. She, she plays Koto or she sits with her mother and, you know, spins yarn she's also, or baskets. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, we, and she doesn't yeah, wear her formal dress anymore. She yeah, spent... she, she's resigned herself and this is like the part of the original story as well where this depression begins to be apparent. Yeah, I mean, it's almost she as if she's her in her She time doing handiwork. She's using her hands. She's doing labor, playing right. music to you know, focus on anything else. There's some really. physicality there that allows her to have some small self-expression. Perhaps yeah. in a callback to the handiwork that she saw as a child yeah. that was what the people were doing there. And just the and fact again, that I mean, labor gives meaning. Plays a, yeah. yeah. Labor plays a role in almost every act. Like act one, it shows up. Act two, it shows up. Act three, uh, less so in Takahata's version here. Definitely, I mean... Um, the reframings of how this one noble was held by his seamen and, you know, the harness thing which was held by workers, in a way it shows up. But really, again, he has a very meaningful gesture at the beginning of this act, Kagria, starting to basically immerse herself in labor. Did in we labor mention only. how, I think we totally forgot the bit where we, we see uh, Tsunamaru again. 
uh, and he that's a gets... bit later, right? Is it? Oh later? no, I he, it was shows up, no. he shows up. Oh, he shows up during yeah. the Five Lords. Arc, yes, it's. it's uh, I think and... it's when she's. Uh, either returning she's returning from, from the, the soccer cherry, yeah she's yeah. returning from seeing the, the cherry blossoms and then he shows up he's stolen a chicken which again it's an, another obvious class moment there where he's yeah. stolen a chicken assumedly because he wants to eat tonight uh and he's poor and he's in the city and he's got nothing else to do uh and but then he sees kagia for a second there's kind of this moment between them and like they're stunned to see how far apart they've, they are you know, like there's this kind of unbreakable barrier mm-hmm. now placed between them, like this lady in this proper proper palanquin like carriage thing, and then he uh, gets jumped by uh, the guys who want their chicken back and beat the shit out of him. Yeah, I just gotta As say, she this kind was... of helplessly is brought away by by the carriage. Yeah, like uh, this, like once again makes class very visible. Uh, like we go from like a moment where her own like class is like made visible by others treatment of her and then like in this scene like the the way uh, people uh treat us uh, sutamaru is like clearly again like colored by class mm-hmm. and if this was a disney movie he would have snuck in on her carriage and that would have been a beginning of like a made-up love story to make the story happier not what's gonna happen in this movie i'll tell you that much <laughs> He gets the shit kick out of him. Yeah. yeah also, while we're talking about the um the emperor, I mean not the emperor. Why did I say that? The five lords yeah. before the emperor. Yeah. Uh, one one other thing that I think is a very interesting change from the book, from this original story that we didn't bring up, I don't think, was the fact that, um, in the original story, the woodcutter becomes uh rich and he builds a big fort around his house or something like that, but he's still like kind of remote, and he tries to keep uh, the princess away from everyone wants to keep her kind of hidden hidden and coveted but in this story like we say with the gatsby comparison he's trying to like transcend his class he's always trying to like act the noble and like put on airs for all the nobles and do what they would want so he actually instead of driving the five lords away until they can like they i think in the story they like petition him for ages until like they're finally led into the palace but in this he kind of like sets a place out for them right away and almost puts her on show like he's like, well, come meet my daughter and marry her right away, right now. Like he's almost capitulating to everything he thinks they would want in an attempt to make up that class difference. And and yeah. also so it's, again, this, it's uh, what he imagines that yeah. will make Kaguya happy. Although he never actually stops to ask her what will make her happy. And that's his that's his fatal flaw. But he is doing all of this because he believes in this, you know, um in in the way of things that you know, a woman will be happy by by marrying the most, uh, you know, suitable bachelor or a suitor. Yeah, the most uh, eligible and like the the wealthiest and most honorable man. So, having uh, rejected or indirectly killed, uh, rest in peace, Rip. the uh, uh, the five uh, suitors. Uh, she uh, uh, Kaguya seems to, at the very least be a bit free from patriarchy but what she's not ready for is ultra patriarchy coming for her the emperor of course the emperor has heard that wow there's this one lady who has rejected the five really high up suitors that means she wants me that's his actual thinking he thinks that means she wants me the emperor he really is ultra ultimate patriarchy he's literally the patriarch like the top of the the country's caste and like uh hereditary system and the one who has really has the most divine you know right basically but he looks really really uncomfortable like he's supposed to look he's he's supposed to be in a way look attractive i think like like a handsome man but at the same time like you know he's like a creepy fucking sex pervert like you see it in his eyes. It's you something it really got the Patrick head. Bateman look going on. Hardcore. <laughs> oh yeah, that's Patrick Bateman to a T. That's so good. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So that's that's his logic. Um, and I I can I can kind of like a bit understand his logic, especially like the way his attraction begins with the fact that she's so unusual. Um, there is this like. That she's so hard to get. That's exactly, more or less exactly. What it's more about that she, yeah, yeah and, and even as he like calls for her to to the court, which like she has to do, 
she rejects it and like uh the her father the bamboo cutter he's like what 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 but but the but the emperor will like that that's not allowed and she's like okay listen to me you little shit well she doesn't say that but like it's implied okay uh she's like well if you want it so bad like i want to not be owned so bad that i would literally die if i married him if but if you wife, want it yeah. so bad I will go there, I will marry him, you can get that position in court that he's offering you, and then I'll die. How about that, huh? And <laughs> Which is really rough, because, yeah, you know, her dad isn't in it for his position, but in this moment, exactly. I don't think she can see it that way. Yeah, but because, like, he is, he does get offered, like, a court position, which would, like... The reason... And he does clearly have this insecurity about, like, being, you know, again, nouveau reach, being a, like... A peasant uh, in yeah. origin. But again, to the, the motivation from the beginning and always has been because he yes. wants to give Kaguya the greatest happiness and he's only doing it in the way that he understands according to the customs of his society that he, he wants to be more worthy to give her this life. But the flaw there is that he never once stops to ask her what she wants and what will give her the greatest happiness he assumes that he knows that this mode he he listens to the customs of society over his own adopted daughter's wishes so he does not grant her autonomy in the same way that the mother does which is you know from a position of I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to ask you how you're feeling. I'm going to ask you to tell me what's really on your mind. But the father never asks this. And it's not for lack of love. It's just, it's for so totally wholesale buying into this system, which is supposedly supposed to bring the most happiness. Yeah, he, he, he sees like th this princess as... Uh, a blessing and as like a task to fulfill yeah. to like give her this life that she clearly deserves and the heavens want right. for her whereas the mother sees her as a child person to love and take care of yeah exactly and and, and and like there's there's a way in which like both of them like they they, they clearly ha have have this love like the father is misguided but you like that you very rarely doubt that he like genuinely does it out of like a, a love and a, an idea that this is what is the right thing to do to make make her happy or at the very least give her the life she deserves and the mother while like she uh she at times is like a bit too passive uh, right. about this like these things happening but like clearly like does it again out of love and wanting to like keep this like family together and keep uh like g give her yes g give her this like stability as well right it's they're, they're sympathetic without like and like they're, they're not vilified but they have flaws but they're like very flawed people mm -hmm. and it, and that's part of the tragedy of the whole thing but as you were saying you know Kaguya does you know make very clear her feelings and her desires to her father in this very stern way because in that it's not that she's trying to slap him in the face it's more that he, she's trying to wake him up to the fact that he is making her unhappy yeah he's he's killing her in a way yeah yeah i mean we'll get her. to the yeah. best line in the movie a bit later but i guess i'll drop it here this happiness you wish for me was hard to bear oh my gosh yeah the, the, that's the idea of this of of being smothered right like he constantly is over eager and 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 really trying to in in all of his love is pouring out, but it's smothering her. Even from the time that he found her, he he's cradling her in his in his little hands, and he's like, "Oh, she's so delicate. I have to be very careful." And the mom is just like, "No, she's just a baby. Like, give her to me." And then instantly she starts growing. She's she's able to grow, right? She's able to change and expand who she is. But right. the the father is constantly smothering her. In, in this way of like trying to preserve her beauty and her happiness and her, you know, uh, divinity. 
but you know in a way that doesn't recognize her identity or her autonomy right and there's also of- it's this love is fundamentally like controlled like this image and ex, um idea of what this love should be is fundamentally controlled by like the cultural hegemony that defines uh everything around them and his view of the world of like a princess has to be this way and should want to be this way and like live up to these things right that's yeah. why she he's like he admonishes her like why why must you be so difficult because he really can't imagine that anything would make her happier. He thinks in this case that she is mistaken about what will make her the most happy. And that's, yeah. of course, that, that patriarchal, you know, arrogance in, and believing that they are, that this is the right way just because that's, you know, the custom. Yeah, and in, in the original fairy tale, uh, there's, there's this moment where um, the, the princess Kaguya, she, like, straight up asked like wait but i i i want to like just be with you i'm happy here why why the marriage thing and the, and the father is just like uh the bamboo cutter is like uh well put it this way it's just the way of life that eventually a a a, a, a lady would um, be married to a to a man who could make uh who, who can make her happy? What what um, I feel here is a it's sensitivity. It's the way things are, you know. It's a sensitivity towards how people who reproduce hierarchy and tradition and patriarchy and so on do not do so necessarily out of bad faith or out of, out of right. aggression or Absolutely. anger or, con- or, or not even necessarily a desire to control, even though that's a factor here. They do it because they've been taught, they've been raised, they've been growing up in a world that has told them that this is how to live, that this is how to be happy, that yeah. material wealth, that being higher class, that being you know in a good marriage with a rich, successful powerful man all of these things are what yields happiness and these are the conceptions that we give through generations it, and, it is in a in yeah. a word purely ideology it is purely it is schniff. yeah and yeah that goes back to <laughs> yeah. you know and and this this idea that like yeah that all these people have internalized this system for obtaining success you know which is interpreted, you know, success in the society and raising ranks in the society is interpreted as happiness by this, uh, you know, cultural imagination. And Sagami, the tutor, after she rejects all of the suitors, she's like, nope, I can't, I can't even do this anymore. Uh, like she's, no, she's unfixable. hopeless. She's unfixable. She's, she, she wants to be apart from society. So therefore there's nothing left for me to do. And then similarly, you know, even as a woman, you know, she's she has wholesale bought into this. And who else but the emperor has been has internalized all these notions, you know, the most because yeah. for him. But before we get directly to oh, the emperor. Right? All right. Sure. Um, I just wanted to notice one thing. What what I find interesting here is that this is the most fuck tradition way of saying uh, reject modernity, embrace tradition, right? Like this movie is such <laughs> an interesting. We should restu- return to the pastoral, innocent life where we're more in tune with nature and more community focused, but also fuck tradition. It's I it, it, it's it's a marvel. Like Takahata pulls this off multiple times because it's always like this. Um, how should I put it, like walking on knife's edge because you yep. could fall into romanticizing the rural life and the traditional life and the pastoral too much. And you could also err on the side of, you know, pushing people too much to conform to tradition. But it's always through the agency of female characters that he explores these concepts all the way back to, you know, uh, Little Norse Prince Horus and also Anne of Green Gables. Like it's already in those works, like the balancing between the rural, domestic, pastoral and the, you know, agency of female characters i i think i I think the word tradition gets like bandied around for to to signify a lot of kind of uh, things that are more distinct than we like to think um like the quote-unquote traditions like out in the pastoral life uh like in uh like communities in touch with the land they live in those traditions um Ha- often have some sort of practical value of they stem from uh, the natural like respecting world respecting nature yeah respecting the natural world observing the cycles um and 
uh, yeah, yeah, and being in harmony with the uh, natural resources and not exploiting them, whereas the other kind of traditional exactly is a rigid, you know, adherence to cultural norms that are it's for it's ceremony. It's ceremony, and it and it's to uh, preserve or to uh, performatively. Uh, you know, reify uh, power structures, right? Yeah, yeah, and and it, it, it's a it's a big like thing to uh, to to w- work around our imaginations of history and what is and isn't quote unquote uh, traditional, yeah. um, like it's especially in, in an age of climate change where there's a lot of discussion about what a society that's truly like in touch with uh, nature that respects nature as uh, as like more than it respects things like you know profit and hierarchy yeah how like that like we look to the past and to quote to some sort of traditions and to native cultures especially that that are still in touch with that part to, for look for ways in which th- that can be realized whereas like um more right wing forces will use the idea of tradition as like an end in and of itself uh as like well it's uh, it's an it's yeah. the tool to maintain power yeah. structures yeah the tool to maintain order and power structures to limit yes. human freedom yeah yeah because whereas like, nature the traditionalism yeah. in nature and that is expressed in this pastoral life is one of absolute freedom right now they are maybe absolute freedom is a little bit of an exaggeration because yeah. they are limited in what it what is required of them of their time and their effort in sustaining themselves right however yeah. it is shown that this that these activities for that purpose because they are so freed from a like power structure it's it's you know they it's this uh, it's the alienation of life within a modern society that is what cages the people they're in to adhering to these rigid structures uh, of culture. But I'll, I'll, I'll have to say, though, that I don't think this work is presenting a odd claim and it doesn't present a utopian world no. to which we must only return but it is rather studying exactly how this pastoral innocence is actually impossible and this it is happens impossible. in ways yeah yeah this happens in multiple ways i mean for one thing as a child kaga doesn't experience deprivation poverty hunger sickness and, and right. any of these things nature right. is no overly ideal subtle. yeah yeah but yeah. she experiences really relatively soon that part of human culture, human civilization, human communities coming together, there's inherently power structures and there's yeah. inherently loss, grief, pain, sadness, partings, goodbyes, you know? Yeah. And that the movie is more or less meditating on the inevitability of the impossibility of the innocent pastoral, but how living this world, in this life, it is still worth it because you know pain and suffering joy and all makes life worth living more so than yeah. you know the dead moon but i guess we get to that in act five yeah, we'll where get I can that in act say five. the same thing again but about the ending <laughs> <laughs> yeah well anyway uh so the emperor, the emperor fucking uh just uh it's like oh she doesn't want to uh to, to come here now i'm even more interested because <laughs> you know he, he's a he's a weird little freak uh, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, he's like uh, he's the emperor. He's never been denied anything, so uh, you can tell like how it feels intriguing. Yeah. You know, like like oh, she's so mysterious and beautiful. She rejects everyone. I'm gonna go there instead. And at that point, there's really nothing the father can do uh, without getting his head head chopped off. So the emperor arrives there, and he does something that none of the other suitors managed to do. He looks at her he, he like looks past the veil to see her, her face and is immediately like i'm gonna take that and as he attempts it there's this like really powerful moment of uh for lack of a better ver- word like violation yes where he, he comes from behind 
and like uh, wraps his arms around her and, and is like, I'm going to take you to the palace because that's what's supposed to happen. And this he is already when... fucking grabs her and tries to run. <laughs> like that's yeah. his, that's his courtship because he's the fucking emperor and he yeah. can do what he wants. Her face just is the, a the mix facial animation. Of, yeah. On, yeah, her and Kaguya is just she, oof. It's very oof. Like you it's really a mix that. of of anger, uh, of disgust, and of fear. That is so. Just it's so powerful. I mean, just the facial expression alone, because she doesn't yeah. she doesn't move. She on her on her reaction, this is how for me this image does legitimately evoke like rape. Mm. Like it is in 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 it, it is the violation of her uh consent, autonomy, and yeah. how yeah, she experiences this violation. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah how she that, experiences this violation is so intense and overwhelming to her that at this moment, like as we learn, she longs to return to the moon. She wishes yeah, and, she, for a second to not and, live and, anymore. And similar to the like powerful feelings animated in the escape from the palace, this is like uh, an instance where this supernatural like element of her like just arrives. She disappears, not just disappears. I love the way it's animated. Well, she that, stands like, like a noble lady with a swoosh and all elegant like like yeah. Sagami was teaching her. But like unnaturally fast right. in a like gliding way that's clearly not like yeah clearly not how humans people would walk move. yeah how people and, move. And, and she them. fades out. There's this yeah. real <laughs> she goes them. <laughs> yeah, there's this real nice. irony to that because you know she is taught when she's being raised as to to have the etiquette of a noble lady that you know a woman a, a noble lady you know stands elegantly always you know with a swoosh. And he or she does that, but to such an extreme that it has now ceased to be human at all. Like, yeah, and it becomes an act of defiance instead of an uh, an act of like subservience well, and uh, it, conform. It's an act of defiance, but one from a really vulnerable place to the extent that yes, in in that in that moment, she and she says this later that she she wished out subconsciously she wished out to the the people of the moon to come rescue her she wishes Which for an escape suicide. and her, exactly it's suicide she has yeah. in this moment signed her own death warrant and because what is the motivation behind that it's because she in, in coming to the earth, it was because she longed to live. She longed to have a life where she could be free and she could enjoy everything that life has to offer. And then she was confined and oppressed. And it's gotten in, in that moment where even her bodily autonomy is violated. She cries out for an escape she now life itself has become her cage in her in her you know that that's how it feels in the moment to her right and she comes to regret this um but her in in that moment that's the that's the only escape that she can think of because yeah. now and it's it's a very important reframing of yeah. of the whole scene absolutely because yeah in, in the uh in the original, like like uh, the same beats sort of play out, where the emperor is like, "Okay, I'll 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 say, keep my distance. Can you please show yourself again? I recognize that there's something magical going on here." Um, and in the original, it's presented as like the emperor being taught a lesson of sorts, uh, similar to how uh, her like missions to the five nobles was in some sort of like divine knowledge she has that she uses to teach a lesson about uh trying to achieve the impossible trying trying to obtain the impossible and here it's like t uh, teaching the emperor a lesson of like not uh n not being like uh as divine as the, as the truly divine or something like that uh, and the emperor in the original story seems to learn his lesson lesson he's like Oh wow! I am I am in awe before this this little miracle, and I shall keep my distance and take my leave. 
uh, although I, uh, and I shall remember your face forever for, for its beauty and thank you for that. And he leaves. And that sort of, that kind of is made, made to, to like justify this, like the, the finale of the original story in which she like writes him a letter saying like, I think we could have been a good thing. Mm. Um, and, but in, in this one, some of the same story beats happen. Only his like attempted em- uh, his em- embrace, quote unquote, is like <clears throat> clearly such a like deeply like hurtful moment of like violating her autonomy, and like when she reappears, he moves to touch her again because that's like he just can't help himself. He's like th- that's just what what he is. Yeah. And he and he, he he retreats and and he's like almost playful about it. Like, okay, I get it, I get it. Uh, I I won't, but I still I still think. What what is it? He says specifically that I still think your happiness lies in becoming mine. Yeah, and he literally like says that. Such like, a, what the? Yeah, that's such a yeah. fucking. But that that's the thing a, like with showing him your whole, whole ass. Patrick Bateman, I, like we said. Yeah, and, and I want I was gonna say this earlier, uh, and we got onto a little bit different topic, but. You know, he, more, more like a patriarchy Bateman. Exactly. Sorry. His his he is the ultimate p- possessor of things that can be desired in the, in the entire land, right? And I talked a little bit earlier about this idea of the desire of objects. That the object wants to be in the hands of the most worthy possessor and there is no one more worthy in the land than the emperor. So th- he presumes that her happiness is with him, that she would want to be his. He says when he, when he, t- uh, you know, takes her into his arms, he says, you know, all women love when I do this. Ugh. Ugh, ew. Yeah. Yeah. Really <laughs> nah. disgusting. But, and he, he, is so convinced of this narrative that as the one who is divinely uh, blessed, who has the you know uh, authority of heaven, that he is free to take whatever he wants. He doesn't have to ask because, of course, everything wants to be wants to belong to him. Everything, again, because the woman is an object. So, you know, he, Kaguya does not want to be an object. And she also uh, is violated by him even presuming that he could touch her and, and take her and handle her as if she already belonged to him, as, as if she had already consented to that. But, you know, to the emperor, the emperor cannot hear no, like, that he presumes yes. Okay, so what's interesting is if we look at Takahata's reframing of the story as Kaguya going to the moon is dying, then really at this point, the critical moment where she decides to die is where she rejects the emperor. Because, you know, kind of implicitly, if you don't accept the emperor, then like off with your head. That's how it was in those days. And that's why the emperor always gets what he wants. So this is kind of like, unstated but like you know very historically obvious idea that like you do what the emperor says because uh he has the whole fucking army behind him right well in Uh, the original tale it is pretty much that's the connotation that she deserves death or at least deserves exile from life on earth because she rejects the emperor and uh it's almost if not a punishment it's a moment where she must be separated from life on earth because she is not following the the right order of things according to the frame the the only way you could reject the emperor is if to not even be on like the same like plane of reality of him basically (laughs) yeah that's what the original story says but also yeah i'm not too sure maybe it depends on the interpretation but i don't think the original story kaguya calls the people of the moon down to her in the no, original story, that, I think it's like she change, kind of just has a limited time on Earth and she yeah. always kind of vaguely, magically knows that. But in this, she specifically wishes it. She, like, wants to die exactly. because yeah, of the I, way I she's being treated. I mentioned this earlier, but 
it, it like it in the uh in the original text it's like uh, pretty strongly implied that she knew for a long time that uh, that her death was coming and she explained to her father that that was uh, the reason why she was re- rejecting all these people was because her time was running out and she wanted to spend it with her uh, her mother and father and the so 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 I, I I think like you can interpret it as like a like metaphorically as she rejects the emperor. Well, she was never of this of world, that, right? Yeah, be, be, because of that, she she leaves the world. I, but there's also like the other way around. She's not of this world, yeah. therefore she feels she has to reject the uh, the emperor, right? And I th- I think, but it's still the, both both readings still portray her actions as not befitting a, a lady. Yeah, yeah, I, I suppose you could say that. Um, but I, I, then again, I think a part of the fascination with this tale and why why it, why it stood the test of time so so much is like this, um, like especially for the time, this idea of uh, the emperor himself pining for something he can't have. There's there's something like, co- uh, you know courtly romantic about it like conceptually mm-hmm. um which like gets totally recontextualized uh in in this work to great effect yeah um but i i just want to p- uh, point that out that that it's not necessarily like a punishment that she has to die it's more like but at the same a fairy tale like uh revelation that like what like what what is like otherworldly must return to the other world, yeah, and that even the emperor can't exactly stop it. I agree with you, which, yeah, however, I think from Takahata's perspective, i mean he in in his interview, he talks about how do we understand Kaguya returning to the moon, like what was her yes. quote sin that caused her to have to go back because as a child, one of the things that he struggled to understand about the story was why Kaguya had to go back. It didn't seem like she really wanted to go back. And it seemed like a a tragedy and something that didn't really make sense. So I think for, you know, because like Nard said, he was had this idea for this film for like about 50 years or, or some kind of concept behind it and, and really examining the tale of the bamboo cutter in a way to make sense of what is Kaguya's internality. And if if we recontextualize the uh, folk tale as being from Kaguya's perspective, then how do we reckon with that ending? And so the changes that Takahata makes is, I think, because he he's dissatisfied with what the sort of implication about her just leaving the earth unfulfilled means yeah and and i i think what 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 you're getting at there this this idea this like reading of the text and being like what why would she have to leave yeah. what spurred that on i think that's where the interpretation takahata chooses which is basically going to the moon equals death yeah comes from because like death, it is like it's just a thing, a like a, a fact of life that doesn't necessarily have like a reason behind happening. It's just something uh, that this not not necessarily like you didn't do anything bad, which leads to you dying. It's 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 just like something that living beings have to it do does but she eventually. prematurely wishes for her death because yeah yeah, yeah. and that, that is a powerful like uh, r- way depression. of like, angling the story yeah. and there's depression depicted i i at least yeah. i think so because she get she grows despondent she stops using you know the, her crafting things he, he she stops weaving uh you know things what she does is she stares at the moon and she you know basically i think she still plays koto but only the same sad melody basically over and over mm-hmm. again. She is completely despondent in the sense that she bitterly regrets that she couldn't live fully, but it's not like uh, her 
basically wish to die is now reversible. I think in a way this uh, very much feels like a very sensitive depiction of depression in the way that people who grow suicidal definitely aren't just, yeah, no, get me the fuck out of here. There's mostly, at least from personal experience, there are people, um, well, I haven't been suicidal, but people close to me have been. So there's often this sense that they wish they could have lived a good life, but they couldn't. And that this yeah. is a regret, a loss that they'll take with them as they wish to die. Yeah. And her wish to die comes from this place of feeling that she is so confined, she's so restricted, and she's so violated, and she has no autonomy, she has no freedom. And so she wishes for an escape. And in that moment, like that, you know, original uh, identity of coming from the moon is what is the only escape that she can think of. But it's a false promise of freedom because freedom as we are un to understand it from the, you know, the, the nursery rhyme, is to be found in life among all of the living things, among all of the nature, among the seasons, among the people who are working. And to wish for death, while it may feel like an escape from this oppression, is not going to claim any autonomy. Right, it's not going to claim the freedom and the happy life that she wanted. It's so she she realizes that she realizes her mistake in that in in what that wish meant. But because of, you know that is in a, a way she's yeah. already dead. This yeah. is how we must read her. She kind of already committed suicide, and right. we only now have like true magic, basically true, the perspective yeah. of someone in their final moments of suicide, regretting it and wishing they could have lived to their fullest yeah, in exactly. fantasy. Like All she yeah. takes flight. We experience the mm. what ifs that we, yeah. we know w could never have really. Yeah, been. she's she's a dead person walking. You know, she's already signed her death warrant, and yeah. she knows and that it where... can't last, and so. And when she confesses to her parents that, you know, they're going to oh, take God. her, like... It's so sad. It's so sad because she's like, nothing can be done. I... And and that's when finally the father breaks down. He's like, I, I don't want to lose you. Like, that's, you know, everything I've done has been for your happiness. I've always tried to take care of you as best as I knew how. And of course, Kaguya knows that. But it's all too late now because... She was smothered so much to the extent that she truly wished for death. Yeah, and this is where the like tragedy comes really comes to fruition. This, uh, like, it it's been like a, an ongoing thing throughout this like uh, this longing for elsewhere and this like coming of winter, coming of uh, of death. Um, and now it and the becomes spring explicit that never in will the text come. that that's yeah, and, and now it becomes explicit in the text that that's that's the ending, yeah. and the it's basically a ghost at this yeah. point. Oh yeah, just you a, know, she's. A, a I mean, ghost. I think ghost is an appropriate term because mm. she's really haunting her life and and haunting the places that she has lived and and reviewing them. It's like this end of life review that she's doing and, and seeing the futility of everything that led to her uh, to her suicide, the meaninglessness of, of all of that and how it robbed her of like her potential. And then we really get to see that the 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 loss of that potential because we were given a glimpse of what that potential might have been when she goes to the countryside again and yeah. and, and sees let's let's talk about that scene yeah let's then. talk uh, about that scene. The, yeah so we're the, entering the, the, act five now because oh, we this have is... we've been in it we've been yeah. in it yeah it, i i think I that when she everything up to this point when she leaves into the countryside act four now we're at sure. five okay because this let's is where the last transformation happens because now we're in this liminal space between her life and death her unlife basically yeah. where she both on the one hand sees all the alternative futures that she might have been 
able to have, the other lives she might have been able to live, or at least she explores those thoughts, as well as she finally recognizes the value of the life that she couldn't live and uh, yes. is able to part with it. And those yeah. are like the big transformative moments that, you know, guide this extremely powerful yeah. and so in, 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 anyway just to explain in one of yeah. her last days she uh sneaks out into the countryside to be there one last time um with the help of her mother if i'm not mistaken yes uh and there she like by by chance she runs into uh, uh sutamaru who uh, at this point is uh is you know a, a young adult with a with a little uh little toddler uh, and a, a wife it's uh we we presume i mean yeah uh, yeah <laughs> yeah and yes yeah and 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 he he's like walking with this uh with this whole like the, the little tribe uh of, of woodsmen presumably looking to uh going to the next uh grove and he hears something that no one else is hearing um and he runs off and he runs into her he runs into uh takenoko um yeah uh, and yeah they have this moment of you know recognizing each other and realizing that they really like care for each other and that maybe just maybe happiness is like right there for the taking yeah and but at first yeah, Tsutamaru is abstract is, dance is, about is like doubts that like even he like doubts that Kaguya Hime would want that kind of life. And she's like, no, I can right, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can work. I can, I can, you know, wear simple clothes. I can, you know, be dirty and I can collect food and I can cook and I can tend to, you know, people's wounds. And she's, and, and he's like, wow, I guess you can. <laughs> like, yeah, she she's just insisting like, yeah, I, I have the ability to do all of these things. It's just that everybody kept telling me that I shouldn't and kept restricting me from from doing them. But it's not that I can't and it's not that I don't want to do it. It's just that that was the position that people put me in. Um, and so then. Tsutamaru's like, all right, let's let's run away together. Let's go somewhere. And at first he like scoops her up into his arms, like princess style. And she's like, nah, yeah. yeah. And she's like, no, I can run up by myself. Yeah. And this is uh in, in the making of documentary, oh, this yeah. is like this part uh which Takahata calls like uh the uh the leap of life. Yeah. Um when they when they like run off and uh, and like jump and begin like floating and flying um that's uh because it's a ghibli movie so of course someone's gotta fly <laughs> no uh just kidding um gotta fly. That's, he he's uh, like Kiki. yeah to, to Tagahara, he like uh spent a lot of time agonizing over this part of the storyboard and trying to figure out how to because what he's like attempting is to communicate this grand idea of like the joy of living itself and how that is what she is like experiencing and, and longing for and getting this release mm -hmm. um and you know what he did a bang up job in my opinion so. because that it's so exuberant and just uh absolutely um i mean they have this like absolute fantastical freedom. Yeah, fantastical in the way that like the rest of the movie hasn't really been. It's like she she has like displayed supernatural things like her her growing her you know ghosting the emperor, but like this is just like completely out of this world, and it feels like some sort of like thing has been unlocked, uh, and I think that that's really powerful. Like especially contrasted with the like preceding like one and a half hours or so of movie right. uh of, of her like getting like more melancholy and depressed over time and yeah the, and the, and this, but it's still there's still this like sadness and melancholy because uh i think we talked about earlier joe joe he says she like reusing the uh the leitmotif from the uh fr from the childhood right. scenes it's this it's yeah, again just, it's a fantasy uh, of 
what could have been based on the happiness exactly, that exactly. was that was that she experienced in her you know uh youth but it's it's not real because it's not going yeah. to be a real life in which she can experience this kind of happiness and again the even though it's fantastical it is a representation of the real joy of of living but it is fantastical in this scene because it will not be Kaguya's yeah. real life it is a fantasy um and yeah, yeah. interestingly it it's implied to be like a, a dream that uh Sutemaru experiences um it's similar to the way that Kaguya woke up in uh, at the banquet uh, after the escape from the palace sequence oh. but this time it's Sutemaru that wakes up after the uh you know the the, the leap of life sequence and like going back to this like family he has started like and obviously again we have this this tragedy mm. of you know these two like just passing each other by and what could have yeah. been you know it's, and it's to be honest of, i think like yeah it's interesting because it one possible reading of course and i think it maybe is a mix of these but one possible reading is that it really was all a dream conjured up by Stemaru. And it's as if like he also is experiencing this inability to return to the past because even though that his family has returned to the same bamboo grove after the 10 years of, of letting the forest regrow, it's almost as if he has this hope there that, that Takenoko will be waiting for him and that he'll get to an experience a life with her that he you know that which is what he had longed for yeah well i, I kind the, of read it as yeah. um yeah it's like they both had the dream right. or the dream was like partly real or connected yeah almost like whether it's real like or not the it magical doesn't nature mean... of kaguya is like this untapped thing yeah. and like we see like it's only over two moments in the movie where these dream things happen but it's like we said it's these kind of regrets that are manifesting where like she wanted to go home and then saw there was no home. Yeah. And then she wanted to like go back there one more time to see Sudamaru again. And it's like, there's, there was maybe this kind of, you know, like the magic of life, the joy of living was always untapped in her life. Exactly. This kind of vague space where she could only ever really dream about it. Yeah. And th this, this is like, I think one of the most powerful parts of the sequence is actual, actually its ambiguity mm -hmm. as to how real, how not real. Is it a dream? Whose, whose dream is it? Like the ambiguity itself is part of the point because it's a thing that does not happen. Yeah. Um, but it is still a, but it, it is still a thing. It, it is still joy. It is a joy um, and it's, it's a representation like the, of the, just the possibility the, yeah, 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 and and the absolute like, the, I th think it's like a, a genius, um, like move to communicate this joy that she's desiring without giving it to her. It's yeah. it, it's it communicates the desire, like uh, the the like this joy, uh, in like. In a, in a really visceral way, and it just it just um, makes while the... still remaining true to the to the tragedy, yes. and in fact strengthening the exactly. Tragedy. I was going to say uh, that it makes the yeah. tragedy all the more exactly. stark uh, when she, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. when she's finally taken back to the moon. So, yeah, you know, ever since I've watched this movie for the first time, I I, I have actually like considered it my favorite uh, in the in the Ghibli canon. And, and and I think like part of the reason, aside from it just being just immensely beautiful, like on, on every aesthetic level, I, I think like the, the themes of it like really resonate with me. It's like some of my favorite stories uh, like are about like the pursuit of happiness and the, and one of the most like the themes I find really like really powerful is this sense of what could have been 
yeah and uh, and and was not it's just it, it's just su- such a universal and and like tragic but also in a way in a weird way life affirming it thing. is life affirming and i was gonna say takahata's yeah. message in this is that even though kaguya's he kaguya hime's life was was all suffering and she was she was unable she was disallowed from that pursuit of her own happiness but that even there are the children singing that song. There are the children, and, and and even though the world and society cannot return to the idealized pastoral, you know, naturalistic coexistence, that the pursuit of happiness is worthy of life, and that even just the pursuit, even if it cannot be perfectly fulfilled, even if there is no idealized utopian uh actualization the pursuit of that happiness is what makes uh life so joyful and the you know yeah. the tragedy of kaguya hime's life is that she gave up her own life before she was you know really able to seek her own happiness she it was constantly being taken from her her autonomy and, and until you know yeah she, she she couldn't see a path forward anymore yeah do do we want to get into the uh, the very ending yeah yes yeah so if, if, if you allow me, I think uh, I want to reconnect to something I started very early on where I talked about how the gifts granted by the moon are sort of coming from above, sort of yes, in a please. hierarchical way. And um, what I see in this procession that comes, because, you know, the father, the bamboo cutter, um, arranged a whole army to protect the palace, to attack the entourage of the Buddha, who personally comes to get Kaguya back to the moon to protect her, to not let her be taken. But what comes overwhelms them all as they see it, right? Because it's this, how should I put it? It's a, it's a like entourage of musicians of like almost statue-like or doll-like, you know, women the, who the, are the playing host the of heaven and the playing, uh, playing their tune. It's a, it's a, it's a They're very really otherworldly. cheerful sounding tune, but they all have dead faces and they all are dressed in gold and crowns and tiaras and what i noticed in an eerie way is how much it reminded me of uh the the prim and proper behavior of the court where you are presenting such a glorious image to the outside Mm -hmm. but actually like your faces are made of stone they are not expressing joy or emotion right you are a you play an instrument in that entourage to celebrate the glory of the buddha at the center of it all and in a way like the buddhist idea of course is to get away from the worldly desires and return to nirvana by the end suffering yes absolutely reach the point where you are free of these desires of emotion of material uh, cravings and so on to say goodbye to them but what happens here is i think this entourage is in in a in a way almost intentionally made eerie and scary and alien because Mm -hmm. they are so bereft of human characteristics. They are so cold like statues as they are coming down, as they are uncaring. They say the parents crying, being sad, that is a flaw of humankind as they are trying to erase Kaguya's memory. They see it as a flaw to remove this essential component of humanity. And this reminds me, of course, directly of how, you know, Kaguya said, well, if you blacken my teeth, I won't be able to love. And then the answer is just, you're not supposed to love. And yeah. in, a, in a similar way, I, I think this is another thing. Like, it is a hierarchy again. It is, but the ultimate hierarchy, God himself basically comes down to make you part of his envoy, to mm-hmm. cruelly take you to your inevitable fate which is death in this sense to take you detachment from what made you human detachment from what made you human and here i want to get into a slight other reading because of course you know we we know takahara it's not just immersed in you know uh, uh, 
uh, Japanese literature, but also very much French literature. He graduated in French literature. I want to get into a Christian take on this ending. Okay. Because oh boy. to me, this whole ending feels like a reverse tale of Genesis. Because in the Bible, the tale of Genesis is, you know, Adam and Eve are in paradise. And in paradise, there is basically no conflict. There's no harm, danger. But you know what's also missing in paradise? Well, reproduction, children, love. Basically, all these things that make human civilization possible, that make humanity possible, are kept hidden or are forbidden in paradise. And it is only by violating what God wants to eat from the fruit from the tree of knowledge that they are expelled from paradise. And in a way, it is framed as a loss. You left this place of ultimate bliss. But at the same time, it's not a loss because what did it give to humans? It gave them the freedom to live, be happy, to suffer, to you know have Cain and Abel who kill each other in, in you know fits of rage, but also to have, you know, children, love, reproduce, have civilization arise, culture arise, everything, you know? And the way that I see this as a reverse genesis is because Takahata critically examines the idea of what would what it would mean to return to paradise, yeah. to long for all of the pain and suffering of the world to be erased. And ultimately, I think the conclusion here is it is not worth living. It is good to rebel against the gods, symbolically speaking. It is good to break out from paradise because with all the suffering and sadness that the world grants you, it is also the precondition for joy and love and humanity to exist at all. And which is exactly why Kaguya says it is not a flaw. Like my parents crying, this is not a flaw. This is what makes being human, which makes life so rich, so interesting, you know. Yeah. Worth it. Yeah, yeah it, it's yeah. that struggle. It's that, you know, this this uh, perfect divine existence that is free from any troubles has no, it has no humanity in it. It's not truly freedom because there is nothing to be desired. Um, yeah. It, but life is which isn't all happiness, which isn't all just pleasantness and, you know, pleasure and, and free of material needs and conditions, uh, even though it has negative aspects to it, it's the struggle for the joy in there and all of these different emotions and all of these different trials and the seasons of life, right, are what gives it all of its color and all of its fullness and make life worth living. And, you know, Kaguya, ew, you know, she embraces her parents and then, you know, they, they she's then taken away when they finally put on the robe of, you know, forgetfulness onto her and but there is still this longing for life in her. And when they're already almost to the moon, you know, she turns back and she sees Earth, which when she was longing towards the moon to 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 have an escape from that place of oppression that she found herself in, you know, she was looking up at the moon and 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 wishing to go there. But now it's the opposite. She's almost to the moon and she's looking back. She's wishing to go back to the Earth. Yeah, and she doesn't it, remember it, it her parents anymore, this, but she, yeah, she has that feeling that mm, that's a world yeah, of pining. color. There's, there's, yeah. there's something there. Yeah, it, it gets back to this like theme of like the cyclical nature of things, and it's, uh, it's pretty much stated that like she, she knows that, um, th that folk song, uh, and and the extra verses from her time uh on the moon as in like in heaven basically yeah um and Where the reason someone why else she was, was singing it yeah. yes and the reason why she was like birthed on uh on earth was because of this uh implacable longing for for life and think and, about this too right because yeah. it's the buddhist idea you are in heaven but you started desiring something so we will send you there so you may get rid of this desire yeah but what she experienced there is not to get rid of the desire, but something that filled her with such a longing for life, 
for something so unerasably important to the human experience that getting rid of desire is the tragic ending. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Nyad, while, uh, while the, the and also it's made futile, Genesis right? Thing because is interesting. I, th I I think like actually the Buddhism thing is like more uh, more apt specifically because the whole like uh, like a, a, a deep seated thing in Buddhist philosophy is this idea that life inherently involves suffering because we by our very nature like desire things yeah. that we can't have and the same end in Christianity goal, by the way there's like, desire it's, it's very and then not exactly no, I, I, I wouldn't say it's exactly the same in Christianity because like what Buddhists like um like the end goal is nirvana is release from life whereas like heaven is like uh, associated with like eternal life and bliss you will um, find that theology is not necessarily uh unified on that matter yeah that's because the thing. In my yeah. reading in my reading paradise is also like in a, in a sense not life it is death because okay. nothing human is present right right and we are born of sin the sin is that we desired to live outside of paradise to break god's rules right and what we long for according to christian ideas is also to return to paradise at the end of times at judgment day you know yeah. Yeah. and in a way these are very parallel sort of things they depending are. on how you read them they are parallel yeah I, I, they're pretty I can comparable least... yeah uh, i would say I though the, for me the buddhism kind of invokes, uh, again, I think the classism angle even stronger. And I think it really ties together, like almost everything from the whole movie, really, about its establishing of class differences as this kind of inseparable division. Uh, because interestingly enough, like a historical note, is that Buddhism ended up being quite class-based class in Japan around about the time, roughly, a couple of centuries off maybe, that... Uh, the original story would have been written because basically the uh, Buddhism came to Japan and then around, I think it's, uh, it says the Nara period. Um, yeah. That it became essentially sponsored by the state so that like all Buddhist temples and stuff were run by the government and connected to the emperor mm -hmm. and like street preachers or any poor people doing uh, like Buddhist practices were like broken apart and like attacked by government officials and it's like no you can only do it in these areas where we deem it and we control it and it's for rich people even though like ironically buddhism is again about to be relieved from suffering relieved from desire and wants mm -hmm. and it's kind of this hypocrisy that mm -hmm. rich people it's very easy for them to say oh i don't need any desires i don't need any wants when everything you have is taken care of yeah they're well, so like, privileged you don't need to worry about that yeah, yeah, the privileged kind of suffering idea where you get to be like a tourist for this spiritual enlightenment. Yeah, they get to yeah, have it's, that it's class easy. performativity of being yeah. so detached from their emotions because they don't have to tend to their daily materialistic needs like to just to survive like the peasants do. And that's seen as unclean and unpure. But to, you know, in, in the way that this film frames it that's seen as the real living yeah and i think the movie frames like we said and you said you know, the movie kind of frames uh buddhism but buddha and his entourage coming down from heaven as almost kind of villainous they're like creepy <laughs> and ethereal and they're doing this like playful magical dance tune as they're basically coming to kill this girl in front of her parents <laughs> as far as the story is <laughs> yeah, concerned that's one way of like it's it. a public execution and also interestingly, I think this is really critical to the class reading, is that, like we said with the Emperor, the reason you don't deny the Emperor is because you die if you deny the Emperor. And the same way, they have a whole army trying to protect the princess, but, like, they're useless. Like, they're so technologically, essentially, outmatched by this other army that, like, you know, this might makes the Buddha right. So he can just walk in anywhere, kidnap a woman like the Emperor, <laughs> and take her where he wants. Because well, he can fucking get away with it. Like, no one's going to stop him. Oh, that, that's, that's a like very... the true that's, power. That's the true higher class that you can't oh, that, That's interestingly, with. that's that's a kind of Western conceptualization of divinity. Mm. Like, fr from, like, you know, uh, old mythology with, like, the, the gods doing what they want and uh, having wills of their own. 
they don't really in this in this case. I I, I would disagree with that reading. Well, I think the they, story the story I'll, presents I'll, them as this kind of other force. I'll say but they Takahata still, yeah, they're otherworldly. Very, they're they're indifferent. The Buddha is a person in the story, like in the movie. Mm-hmm. Like, indif- I know what you mean in like yeah. a grander theological sense, but in the movie, the Buddha is the Buddha is literally a dude who comes down on a cloud, snatches her, and and goes. But like, but I don't think we should yes, understand but, but that I'm he has like a, an a, an identity that is at all. Uh, this indifference, not a this indifference, just means his laws are fundamental to the universe. Not even he; it's not even his will. It's that mm-hmm. that she has to go back to the moon is a fact of the universe. Exactly. This is the ultimate form of power. But this is kind of why I agree with hipster because to me this is still, and I think Takahata is a very Western-minded man, which we know he is. You know, uh, I think this definitely plays into this because the entire movie is sort of about rebelling against the boundaries put upon you about the laws that are put in place and enjoying life despite its inevitable outcomes, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is very much in line with how I see this ending as a sort of final resistance where she says, no, what you claim is just a flaw is not a flaw. So I will, you know, listen to these children sing the song as you take me away and I know they will continue life. Yeah, yeah. Like the, it's, mm. it's the thing that that I like really find, like, like uh, even like way back when I first learned about like many of the tenets of, of Buddhism, just this conceptualization of life as inherently suffering, and the release from that being like the what one ought to desire, right? Not 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 just like something that will inevitably happen, which makes it a law, like, right? Which makes it yeah, a law yeah. to abide by. Yeah, exactly. That that just like doesn't sit well with me, and I uh, I think it doesn't sit well with uh, Takahata mm-hmm. either. Judging exactly. by this, the ending of this right. movie, it's a very atheist kind of movie, honestly. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. I think that you know, regardless of from what theology you kind of tackle this from, it's a rejection of the of the acceptance of. Uh, you know, the ideology of, of how, of what people should strive for in life that is presented by, you know, um, prominent religions. Um, yeah. Which Rejection is a, of Nirvana. Yeah, it's a, it, because it, it, it basically is like, hey, like, stop trying to become detached from life because you're essentially just living a period of unlife, like, Kaguya did when you stop feeling when you stop pursuing joy and fulfillment in life and yeah. instead are focused on rejecting everything that life has to offer as a way to get you know yeah. somehow ascend yeah live in the here and now and self actualized instead of becoming a plain playing piece in someone else's game basically instead of becoming an object to someone else instead of becoming an object to this greater plan of how humanity ought to be or yeah in in the like in the like japanese cultural t- tradition of like the the ephemerality of the moment the the like fragility of the the beautiful here and now that's like at the very least in this movie not supposed to mean that <clears throat> oh sorry <clears throat> that is in this movie like not supposed to mean that you need to like let go of the joy of this moment because mm-hmm. it will come to an end and you have to embrace the ending it's about embracing the moment and like really living it yeah uh, and i think that's like a really really beautiful sentiment that- and like just what what could possibly be more life affirming than someone in heaven longing to be alive on earth? Exactly. Exactly. Which is why it's so important that, you know, she looks back at that earth and says, and there, there's already some longing for that life on earth there again. And, you know, yeah, the song that goes again and. Regardless of whether she comes back, right, you know, the the idea is that there is something to life on Earth that even those beings detached from desire in heaven are longing for, that there is something that is so worthy of, of pursuit 
in that struggle, you know, freedom can only yeah. really be experienced. Like freedom is the autonomy and the ability to act on one's desires. If you're free of desire, then there can be no, you know, true freedom. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's all like much of the contrast happening throughout the movie is between humanity and, and inhumanity in, uh, in many forms. And I think that's where the like strongest parallels between the entourage of the afterlife and the like life at court is that, that they're both like alien, they're both like inhuman in their, um, yeah, in, in their like ways of being. But the uh, the tragedy is I, that I those. I really gotta. Were... I really gotta get some water. Hang okay. on. Okay. I'll be be right back. Two two seconds. Okay. So to carry on with what Platon was saying about the, you know, the 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 people of the moon or the you know, and and the nobility, like being these alien creatures, you know, devoid of desire and things like that. I there is still, while that is true, there is a difference because, the people of the moon are not living beings. They're not living humans as we can understand it. Yet the nobility are, but they're choosing to live in a way that alienates them from this meaningful life. And it's very confining. And, uh, you know, of course, that performativity of this detachment is class performance that is part of those you know hierarchy in in the society but it's it's uh framed in this film as a lack of fulfilling the potential of life yeah uh eat the rich and also the angels yeah <laughs> do, do it Eat the but you know it's like yeah it's there there's this there's this uh, feeling yeah i, I get what you're yeah. saying the, uh, the 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 afterlife uh like you know creatures that they're, they're not responsible for being the way they are they have literally forgotten everything they experience no suffering and no joy the uh it's the people on earth who are like fucking shit up by you know denying uh, people and especially like women, yeah. the like the autonomy to pursue their their own happiness right. and, and yeah their own freedom. It doesn't have to be this way, is what Takahata is yelling. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It do, it don't always you know be like it is, but it do or something. Yes. And but, yet the the know. oh about the the last stand, you know, the emperor's men all like fall over and asleep, but what. That's, what is the that's kind of from the original text. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But what's not in the original text is the children led by May, you know, uh Kaguya Hime's like uh you know, sort of a handmaiden, right? Yeah, best absolutely. character. Yeah, in the movie. she's so great. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely great. Like two time. lines of the whole movie and steals the but show. But her expressions and her body language, it's there's so much comedic timing in all of that. It's it's great. She she's a really nice you know, added color to the to what the film has, but yeah, you know, she's living her best they, life in it. In the end, you know, they come and they're singing that song, that song that represents the longing for life, to live freely, as you know, in what the earth has to offer. Right, very explicitly, you know, what is distinct from life on the moon. So yeah, which is why the children are a sense of rebellion as they are yeah. singing as the entourage is coming. To and get their Gabriel. rebellion is actually like more successful than the. It's not. It's not ultimately successful in in rescuing Kaguya, but at the very least, yeah, like, that's not what it's about either, right? They're not trying to rescue her, but they're singing about they are the future generation, like they're yeah. the, the children that are gonna go through the spring and yeah. summer and fall and winter of life. Exactly, and so yeah. Takahata is like, saying, well, you know, is... even though the you know Kaguya's life has come to an end, there is still life on Earth. There is still life worth struggling for, and longing to experience. 
Yeah, truly. But what 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 is what is an emperor's army to the host of heaven, and what is the host of heaven to a group of kids singing, singing about the joys you know, of life? Yeah, absolutely. Like like Buddha getting pwned over here. <laughs> yeah, you, you you think you you think you're so like tranquil and rule the world. Well, watch this. We're little kids and we uh, like to sing. I was like, damn, yeah, good point. The their their joy is like so. There's no airs to it, right? There's no, there's no hierarchy. There's no you know, uh, supposed like divine authority or anything. It's yeah, and and again, it gets back to this like cyclical. Uh, theme yeah. that like s- that keeps the the movie's tragedy like in in some ways like the like the whole like joys of life and and the music and all that like adds to the tragedy but in some ways it also it's also like a, a bit of a bomb because it is a bomb and, and especially yeah. you know after Kaguya's taken and her parents are left crying and the credits roll then oh, we God. get the final ending theme right yeah, which really, right, yeah, yeah. really hits those cyclical, you know, the the themes of, of of the cyclical nature of life and how there's always hope for a meaningful tomorrow. It's not going to be a perfect tomorrow, but it's going to be a meaningful tomorrow, right? You know, one of the excerpts of the lyrics by uh, Nikaido is everything of n- for this life to the end, everything of now is everything of the past. We'll meet again, I'm sure, in some nostalgic place. You know, the warmth you gave me deep, deep down comes to me now, complete from a time long past. So... Yeah, it's it's, it's a really sweet and uh, uh, uplifting little uh, note to, to end on. I think, like, and there's, there's a bunch about this, the, the production of this song in the Making Off documentary. Yeah. And there's like a, a couple of like really interesting parts. One where uh, Takahata like mentions that like uh, this this song is like a lot less sad than the movie. Like he feels like the ending is like really really tragic, and uh, and and the move and and the song is like kind of like lifts the spirit a bit for for the crying audience. Put um, your confused mind at ease. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but like, and and then there's this like really key moment where uh, he's discussing it with uh, with uh, with the singer, uh, and uh, and and like what what like the ending is is like and what he wants from the song, uh, and she like pretty much like hits the nail on the head when she says so like the song should be not a remedy for helplessness but an acceptance. And if that isn't like the textbook definition of like the appeal of tragedy as a like literary thing, mm. I don't know what mm-hmm. is. And you know, acceptance is what we uh, have to have when faced with some certain inevitabilities. And one of those inevitabilities is that all that lives sometimes has to die. I don't want to be too cheesy, but with this, I'm referring, of course, that this is, in fact, the last movie Isao Takahara ever, ever made because in 2018, he was diagnosed and died of lung cancer and retroactively left behind this magnum opus of re- reflecting on the nature of life and death and the cycles and the suffering and the joys of living just right on the cusp of his own life coming to an end. And, yeah. and to me... And also, like... yeah making an indelible mark on like one of the biggest stories in Japanese culture. Like what, what what a legend. And to me, there's a core to this work, which really seeks to rebel. And I think I see something of Takahata's biography in this, because we know Takahata was a lifelong, you know, Marxist leftist communist kind of person, always making movies about the ways people might live better lives reflecting on how people are changing, how they're alienated from their communities and what ways they might find to return to some communities or ways of living. This is a shared motif in, in all of his films, including Kaguya Hima. And uh, with this sense, I almost feel the sense that this is the reflection of someone looking back on his life of trying to change the world and accepting that the world will retain pain, suffering, sadness, tragedy, but that living was still worth it no matter what the world throws at you 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that we should try. My, uh, and uh, and that we should try to create a world in which the future generations have an even more abil- like greater ability to to live life to the fullest. I, I think that that's also part of his messages message here because. The cycle is not about Kaguya returning to the Earth. It's about the next generation that will be on the Earth. Right? Indeed, because she will yeah. not be returning yeah. to this Earth. This is not a least, you know <laughs> she had her life. This is not a piece of you know uh, reincarnation like propaganda or anything. This is just yeah. we came from nothingness, we returned to nothingness, but we can make the meantime worth the while. Yeah, yeah, like that. That's a really. Yeah, it, it it really feels like a final work, or at the very least, the the work of like someone who's like old enough uh, and smart enough to be wise. Um, Indeed, there's wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I, I I think like one of the big themes of of, of the movie uh, that that I want to like talk about my big read on it, um, aside from like obviously like this whole like notion of death and life. I think like the uh, I've mentioned it before, but the theme of like beauty and what it is uh, and and what we do about it as as human beings, um, and, and, and and yeah, and then and this like this theme like again harkens back to the original tale. It's not something like added into the movie, but it's something that the movie tackles um, very very subtly, but uh, but very really powerfully. Um, there's this really subtle um, uh, repeating motif of capture and release. Mm. Like one of the very first things the little baby uh, Kaguya, uh, Takunoko, Hime, whatever you want to call her at that point, does once she like begins crawling around. She sees the little froggies and she follows after them. She thinks they're neat. And she, when she begins walking, she, she's grabbed one of them. And she opens her palm and it jumps out of her hand. And, and then she starts that's... crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then she starts crying because like, no, but you know, that's how it's supposed to go. It's like, and again, she learns a lesson and she grows a bit. Yeah. It's this and desire, they... the quest for, to, to obtain what is desired, the obtaining yeah. of it and then the loss of it. Yeah, exactly, and uh, and that thing repeats itself. She receives the the songbird in the bamboo cage, um, yeah. and r- goes out and releases it with a sad look in her eyes. Later in the movie, when she, I, I think it's a, at the point where she like feels like freed from the from the suitors and tries to like live a be- uh, live a bit better. She like out by the uh, the garden her, her mother has made. She catches a grasshopper and like once again like opens her palm and lets it go she and she this is also where like she looks under a rock and sees all the bugs and insects all all that life and basically like that that's that's the lesson um like even even like with the the old text as as many like you know, blind spots and biases like uh, plague it, which Takahata addresses. That's like one of the themes that still resonate is this like the letting go. Yeah. The like uh, the attempts of all the characters to in some way preserve or own or like uh, and, and to some degree objectify her beauty Um just like falls flat like the five suitors are like the big obvious example like they cut like they want to like in the same way they want like a great treasure but those great treasures are like like something imagined uh and they they like manufacture like fakes they like ma- ma- make attempts and uh, and fail the uh, in in Takahata's version, like the father, especially, mm. uh, like mistakes like opulence for you know authentic beauty, and like tries to like pair her and her like n- natural, uh, like almost ethereal beauty with 
with all these material things that he believes is like worthy of her mm. uh, because he wrongfully connects this like beauty and and purity with those things um and like of of course like the emperor who like is the one to try to like grab onto her hold her and he literally is unable to like supernaturally unable to hold on to her and but by the end of it like she she goes away and the really like the one of the wonderful things in it, in the movie is like it it takes a step back and asks her like what is like this object of beauty from this story what does she find beautiful what does she long for and why and like the answer to that is obviously this like more ephemeral beauty not an not an aesthetic beauty but like a holistic beauty of life and joy and nature and 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 all these things that that are lost when we start trying to hold on to it uh, in some like material physical form um that uh, and it goes back to Tagahata's like uh like r- real like uh, anti-capitalist sentiments that mm. that something is lost when when we like pursue the uh like the material and in the end like the most beautiful thing that's let go at the end is not like this beautiful face or anything of the sort it's it's a life that was lived and the, and it's it's her life that that's beautiful and it's probably the life in her that like is actually what like drew drew people to her in uh, in that way um mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, that's a that's and, a good point. Yeah. Like even trying to encapsulate life and and hold on to it and and keep it in stasis, it goes against nature. It goes against the seasons of change. And yeah. you know, even even the name, Wari, motherfuckers. Yeah, it's definitely Mononoir. Even even the, you know, even the Inbe no Akita, the namer, you know, at first, he is drawn to her and admires her for her willfulness, for her uh, her playfulness, the joy with which she chases a cat beneath the you know boardwalk in a way that is not befitting of a noble uh, maiden, but is still so indicative of the life in her, and that's what he sees. And but yet when as soon as she is given that name and placed into this role as a noble woman, it's an attempt to objectify that, that life and put it into a box, yeah, like into a name, yeah, yeah. put it into a cage. And, and that, that name becomes part of her cage. Yeah. And, and, and yet, and even still, and, and this is like what really like fascinates me so much about this, uh, this movie is really like how, with all the, these this these thematic beats of like beauty being this ephemeral thing you can't capture, the movie does that very same thing yeah. like like no other animated feature I've seen. It's, just yeah. it is just so immensely beautiful from the soundscape and the score to the like to the backgrounds to the like character designs and the way the they move animation. that feels almost yeah, yeah it feels like it. Like when when you see like most uh, a lot of traditional like animations, uh, even like great Studio Ghibli film and, and like films and Miyazaki's like most kinetic sequences, like in some ways, even like a simple drawing in this movie just moving in a natural way feels miraculous. Yeah, it's just I am still like in awe of a lot of like what aesthetically happens in this movie and just the very fact that it manages to like like encapsulate such beauty actually like kind of affects the text itself and the themes itself um it's a and it's, I, it's beauty I don't know. That is, I, I don't know what to do with that it's, I, I just think it's, I just find it endlessly fascinating yeah, I think it, I think it's fascinating too I think I think that the 
the making of documentary really portrays this, that one of the reasons why Takahara was taking so long to make this film is that he wanted it to feel as though the film was allowed to breathe, that the, that there was life in it. And, you know, this constant struggle to find how to communicate that was, was, you know, his constant, uh, you know, constantly on his mind. And the, the beauty of it, right, was created through his labor, but from the labor of so many collaborators and him trying to, you know, him encouraging all of these collaborators and, and, and trusting them to create something, right? This is not something that is from his own vision alone. It's something created by all these different people. And in the previous screening of the, the, the first screening of the completed film, you know, he, he's like, you know, we have created something wonderful and I'm so grateful to all of you. You know, it is ephemeral in that way because, you know, the film starts and it's so breathtakingly beautiful and, and you think, wow, there's something amazing encapsulated here, but then the film has to come to an end and it it can't last, right? It's not, it can't be forever and in a similar way, Unlike the Nausicast. <laughs> <laughs> Which will well, we, we, we came yeah. back, but no, it won't. We This won't last forever either. Sorry, Nerd. We've returned from the moon. Bang. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's, it is, it is this ephemeral thing that was, it is a miracle, just like life is a miracle, right? It, it is abs- like, yeah, this, this movie is a, just an absolute miracle. And, and I, I think you're, you're getting at something, voice with the, um, the, the potential of animation that the, this movie like manages to like fulfill in a way that just like makes it such a satisfying capstone to a legendary like animation director's like career. Yeah. It's just like that, that ephemerality and that movement, it just, it just fits like a glove and, um, it's a gift. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I remember this YouTuber talking talking about this movie and being like, just watching it, you get the sense that like, wait, hang on, this this was always possible. You could do a movie like this. You th- this was was this was a thing you could do. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> were we missing out all this time? What the fuck have we been doing? Like, here it is. Like, look at <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, here's the- <laughs> listen to it. <laughs> I fuck. mean, it's took eight years to oh make, right? God. So yeah, yeah. It's shit. there's there was Which some. The th- first five were not working on it much. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> conceptualizing and well, not drawing a single frame. Let's just say that you know, it's it's yeah. like this. This is possible, but it's also achieved through a community coming together and contributing labor to it. I, I think that this also, like, I mean, goes into the sort of you know the the idea behind the the better way to live that Takahata is kind of offering to people to think about in this film is this way of living as a community and everybody contributing by offering their labor, but also everybody able to express themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we, yeah, we highly you recommend the, that last part yeah. of the documentary about the previous screening because that was yeah. the part that uh, that really got to me the most. It was the most like emotional part of it yeah. finally being done and just seeing everyone there and like because yeah, the documentary I think frames it very well where it's Isao Takahata's vision, but like so many people involved along the way, like really added to this movie and really contributed in like such a meaningful sense. Yeah, for example, you know, in the producer Nishimura was uh, in the documentary quoted as saying, you know, to Takahara, this, when when they were getting to the end of production, you know, he was like very proudly said to Takahara, like, this is my movie. And Takahara was like, yeah, you're right. It is your movie. Just as it's, you know, it's my movie and everybody who works on it, it's their movie. And the more, the more people that feel like it's their movie, that it's their movie, 
piece of artistic expression, the better a work it will be. And so it's simultaneously this this collaboration. It's my movie. But it's also an individual <laughs> expression for each of the artists, right? This podcast has really made it our movie. Yeah, really. <laughs> it's yeah. our movie. <laughs> Ours now. Yeah, no. It's but, humanity's yeah, yes, movie yes, now. Absolutely. It's yeah, and, and like uh, it, it, that, that's part of the miracle of it. Like, like I, I say, like it feels miraculous whenever, like whenever there's a new cut and you see those backgrounds or you hear those notes from Hisaishi or you listen to the sounds of nature or you just just see those characters like move and express themselves it's just like everything about it it's it's like holistically just fucking non-stop bangers yeah <laughs> for lack of a better word and yeah i, I, I think i've classic. said my piece it's it's immensely beautiful to the point where that very beauty affects the very text of the and, and subtext of the of the film yeah. in my view yeah and which yeah, just makes I, I don't it have so rewarding. Else to say. Uh, I think yeah. we've, we've all kind of exhausted ourselves getting in every bit of it. Physically, uh, mentally, <laughs> cognitively, <yeah>. verbally. <laughs> yeah. um, there only just, remains uh, one question. I was going to be... say the, the oh. main takeaway for me is be less like Sagami, a boring lady who doesn't laugh, who's told what she's supposed to be by others. Be more like Mei, the handmaid, <laughs> uh, fun. Always living in the moment, enjoying life to the max, you know. Perfectly adapted <laughs> Take to the marshmallow pill. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to quote the animated short film World of Tomorrow. Uh, now is the envy of all of the dead. And there only um, remains... Rest in peace, Takahata. Rest in peace, Takahata. And there only remains one question to be answered. One final question. The most important question to humanity is... Uh, is after editing this going to be our longest episode? Have we beaten Spirited Away? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> the, the, I don't we did not know. My recording is at five hours and ten minutes. Let's see how much well, we we'll see how, we had how it plans out numbers-wise. Right. Okay. Um, the more important is, question this is, will we be back? To will watch, we be back? Um, when Marnie was there uh, uh, when, in a month from now. When, when was Marnie there? Oh, wait. When was she there? Hopefully yeah. a month from now. We will learn soon. Uh, yes, we are going to be there for that. Hopefully next month. I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to do it, mainly because I've already finished my research. I've written an entire thesis about this <laughs> and, and got pretty good grades on it. And I'm going to make... cheating. And, 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 I might, and I might either give you all my sources or make you read it. You can choose one. <laughs> no. You uh, just need to do an audio recording of you reading out the whole thing. And yes. That's the podcast. We can just cheat. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Maybe. Well... No. I, I can't believe we've reached, like, the final Studio Ghibli film. Oh, it's yeah. I mean, um, you, yeah, for all of y'all, that's that's way more impressive. Uh, I'm new. Oh no, <laughs> I'm new. But y'all have done like over twenty episodes, so it's amazing. We still got a lot more to go from here. There's plenty of adjacent stuff. Yeah, well, I, we'll get to that by the end of the next episode, I think. Yeah, for now it's really time to wrap this up. I uh, thank yeah. everyone who had the patience to listen to us uh, uh, for this very long podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you also like the movie and had some similar thoughts. Share your thoughts down below. I, I'm, I'm comment whoring now. Please comment. And, you know, hit the bell. It's, it's what they do today. Swipe right on us. Is yeah, it swiping prove right? Prove to us that we are real. Yes, prove, give me material wealth as a compensation for my, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we want to see those likes shoot up like bamboo we ha- stalks. We have oh, a yeah. Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Narsicast, I think. Yes, <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the description. The mental uh, faculties ways. after a five-hour podcast are deteriorating. We need to quickly evacuate and refill on life energy by touching grass, as Takahara would approve of. So uh, no 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 cutting grass cutting grass as Takahara would approve <laughs> of and weaving a cool hat out of it or something <laughs> some handiwork we need to craft something we gotta steal fruit and, uh, we gotta steal I fruits think... I'm oh, actually yeah, gonna going over to my that. neighbor and stealing his <laughs> pumpkins or whatever I don't know. yeah cut, cut it with a knife we always have would you believe that my neighbor literally has a pumpkin I don't know why that's powerful like... well soon he won't. <laughs> Well, good luck I mean, with that hipster. April. I don't know why people have pumpkins. But uh, stealing the I'll pumpkins right gonna be, is going to be a wild ride. Tell us about it next episode. And I would say until then to everybody, next time we're going to talk about When Money Was There by Yonobayashi before he leaves Studio Ghibli, his final film with Ghibli. 
Um, and it's going to be great. So tune in when that happens. And I say goodbye to everybody until then. Bye. Bye. Bye.